Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for DWOG April 2021. Um, as the Teams meeting is letting you know, this meeting is going to be recorded and it will be available at a later date on our YouTube channel. Um, in order to make this as good a recording as possible and to make sure that everyone attending has the ability to hear and see and obtain the best experience possible, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. First, if you could, please ensure that when you're not speaking, your camera is off. Uh, if you are in the main chat window or the main meeting window, you should be able to see a black bar across the top with a camera icon. And by clicking on that icon to obtain an, a line slashed through it, your camera will turn off. By turning it on, you would toggle it one more time and that camera would come on. So anyone who's um, able to, please, if you can turn your camera off um, until we have open discussion later and uh, you have an opportunity to share your camera and your thoughts. Um, likewise, uh, there is a mute functionality that looks like a microphone. If you are needing to uh, ask a question, um, if you could remain on mute, which is toggling so that there is a slash mark through the microphone and uh, either use the chat functionality so if you look in that same bar at the top, there will there will be a uh, bubble icon with text potentially appearing on it. And if you click that, it'll open a chat stream, which will appear on the right hand side of your screen. This will let you know when people come, when people go, and then if they were to have a comment. So here's an example of me adding a comment and the fact that everyone in the meeting should be able to see that. Uh, myself as a moderator um, and the others attending the meeting will be able to see that and that'll be a note for us to go back and answer your question or address your concern. Um, if you have something that you'd like to address in a live fashion and the chat functionality is not uh, not the best for you, uh, next to that chat functionality, there will be a little icon with a smiley face and a hand. This gives you a couple of reactionary options. Um, there are the four icons on the left, which are a thumbs up like, a heart, an applause, and a laugh. Um, feel free to use those. We do have them turned on for the meeting. Um, but the one that probably matters the most to y'all is that far right hand option, which is the raise hand option. If you choose to raise your hand, um, you can basically put yourself in line to answer a live question and be able to turn on your microphone or your audio, whichever one you prefer, to be able to ask that question um, in front of the group. And uh, I'll be able to see in the chat functionality who raised their hand in what order and, and that way um, have it as a, uh, a fair option. And for those of you who um, are called on, your hand will remain raised until you click that button again. So once you've had an opportunity to address your, your thoughts or concerns, if you could please re-click that button. And instead of saying raise hand, the icon will now say lower hand and it will take you out of the queue for questions. As I mentioned, um, these are this is going to be a recording that is available on our YouTube channel. It will appear in the next day or two. Um, we have to make sure that we have it in the proper formatting and that we offer um, transcripts, et cetera, for accessibility. So please, if you'll be patient, but if you see something today that you'd like to share with others in your organization who are unable to attend, um, that will be an option. And they are held there. Um, so you can see ones from our January meeting and our October meeting and back forth. Um, also, for those of you who are wanting to follow along and you may have experiencing some issues with our PowerPoint, um, depending on whether you're, you're, you're joining from a desktop or whether you're joining from the mobile, um, sometimes the PowerPoint is uh, ahead or behind. Um, we experienced that during the last meeting. So you should be able to go to our website. Um, so go to tceq.texas.gov, um, search in the uh, top right hand corner for DWAWG, D-W-A-W-G. That'll bring you to our main DWOG page. And by scrolling down, you'll be able to see the invites for today, the agenda for today, but also there will be a content for today. So we have been able to make our PowerPoints into PDFs. Um, so you should be able to, as long as you have Adobe Reader of some sort, obtain those PDFs and follow along in that fashion if you're having trouble with the team's live functionality. If at any point in time you're having issues during the meeting today, 
Um, please feel free to use the chat functionality, but if that is not working, we do have the ability to obtain emails. Um, there is a DWAWG or DWAG at tceq.texas.gov -E email um, where you can reach us and uh, we'll be able to uh, communicate amongst ourselves and hopefully address your concern, get you uh, joining us live, whatever your issue might be. All right, hopefully that covered quite a few of our uh, housekeeping issues. Once again, just as a reminder, um, you should uh, please join muted and remain muted with your camera off um, until uh, we have open discussions or you have a question. Feel free to use the raise hand feature at any time. With that said, um, my name is Michelle Risco. I am the manager of the drinking water standards section in the water supply division of the TCEQ. Uh, this is our drinking water advisory work group meeting for April the 13th of 2021. This is a virtual meeting held through Teams, and we uh, believe that the agenda for this meeting will run from approximately 9 a.m. this morning until 12 o'clock p.m. Um, our first presentation is going to be from Ms. Shannon Watson, with the Occupational Licensing Group, and she'll give you guys a quick rundown and update of what's going on in the licensing division. Shannon, are you available? I am. Let me see. Can you see me? <laughs> Good morning. Okay. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of updates. A lot of things are going along as they normally would. Um, there's not a whole lot of super exciting things going on, but we do have a couple of things that I wanted to let uh, this group know about. Um, so all but about three of our exams are now available on computer-based testing. Um, the Water A exam is available at all our computer-based testing centers that can accommodate a six-hour exam. And we are working diligently to get the wastewater A exam on computer based testing capabilities um, as soon as possible. If we could get it by the end of this calendar year, that would be fantastic. But that is one of our current projects. Um, for the wastewater A and for Spanish version exams only, we are holding paper exam sessions once a month at the TCEQ central office. Regional offices are still not open to the public, and so we are unable to offer those paper exams there. However, um, we do offer them once a month in central office in Austin, and you can register through Lexer, um, and I will post that link in the chat so that you can collect that if that's something that you're interested in. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to put it in the chat or, or uh, send us an email. I'll give you some contact information after I'm finished giving updates. Um, the other updates that I have are related to our COVID response page. Um, when over a year ago, when COVID started, we created a COVID response page. And again, I'll put a link to that in the chat as well um, to keep people updated on extension policies and any waiver policies that we had, um, ways that they could more easily facilitate renewing their licenses, that sort of thing. We're continuing to up that, update that on a regular basis. And so I highly recommend um, every couple of weeks just taking a quick look at it just for your information, essentially. Um, however, there are two sort of major changes that I wanted to bring up in this um, in this venue. The first one is that um, a reminder that all occupational licenses that expire after August 31st, 2020, so last August, are expected to comply with the original three year renewal cycle. We are now in terms of renewals following the rules with with no exceptions. We are not offering extensions any longer. Um, when COVID hit and people could not get what they needed because there weren't enough online courses or they were had COVID or had family members with COVID and so were quarantined, um, we were fairly liberal with understanding 
that people needed um, a little extra time. However, with the vaccine and with the control in Texas, with masks and other um, stay at home opportunities and, and online course opportunities, we've decided that if your license expired after August 31st, 2020, there were plenty of opportunities starting that September, so last September, to be able to meet all the qualifications and requirements to renew your license in a timely fashion. Um, just letting y'all know that. If I did, so one of the exceptions that we are making is that license that expired between March 2020 and September 2021, so this coming September, um, we will continue to waive the eight hour hands on BPAT requirement. Um, all BPAT license holders must still obtain 24 hours of total continuing education to renew their license, but those up until licenses expiring on September 30th, 2021, can take additional continuing education courses rather than the hands on. Starting October 1st, if your license expires October 1st, you will be required to demonstrate that you took the eight hours of continuing education hands on BPAT practical. Um, we feel that by October 2021, so by this October, um, a majority of Texans will be vaccinated. The risk is uh, minimal, and I know that many of the training providers who, who offer this practical hands on training have set up uh, socially distant. Courses and classrooms and um, are ready to accommodate people to be able to manage any risk that still exists in October. Um, so those those are the two primary updates on our web page that I, I thought probably needed to be um, publicly announced. We will be sending an email out to BPAT licensees, letting them know about the um, ending of this waiver. And um, if there are any questions, I am happy to take them. And I will put uh, contact information for additional questions in the future in the chat. That's all I have. Thank you, Shannon. Um, let's pause just a moment or two to see if anybody has any questions before we move on. Ah, yes, we do. David Sanchez indicated that uh, they're struggling to hire licensed plant operators. Have you noticed a downturn in the number of people getting licensed? I have not. In fact, um, we are at or above the numbers of new and renewal licenses coming in. Um, I will tell you that we do have a backlog, a significant backlog because we had two vacancies for several months. And we have now hired two new people who, once they're trained, will be able to get up back up to speed. And so we're expecting to be uh, back up to where we were pre-COVID. However, right now, just because of the vacancies, um, it's taking a little bit longer to process applications. And so if you've submitted a renewal or something, please um, have a little more patience. We're getting to them as fast as we can. There's like 11 people doing a, a possible 50, well, we have 55,000 licenses. And so um, processing all of that with, with the small staff that we have takes a little bit of time. So um, as for a downturn, we are not seeing it. In fact, we've had, um, we've had over 100 renewal applications a day for several days each week, the last couple of weeks. So they're out there, um, just not sure what they're doing with their license. Um, is there so a way, Shannon, to um, have people be able to search for a specific license type in their area uh, that they could uh, potentially find operators they need? Absolutely. Um, there is on our on our search page. Um, and again, I should make a note. I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, we have uh, it's it's a little bit complicated, um, but we we have an a search for groups where you can say I need a 
wastewater C level license or whatever license level you need, and then you can select the county or the region or put in the city, and then it will give you a list of the licensees in that area. Um, and then our our individual search, and I'd have to I haven't looked at the group search in a while, so I can't remember if it shows phone numbers, but I know that the individual search provides phone numbers and addresses. So um, so that might help you. And and Michelle, I can type up a real quick uh, guidance for how to do that. If you guys want to include that in the minutes. Yes, know. we can absolutely do that and attach it to our website if people want to come back okay. and take a look. OK, um, I, I, I believe we have one, but if not, I will do uh, how to how to do a group search. Um, and get that. Do I just send that to you, Michelle? Yeah, that'll be or just Sean. fine and we'll get it accessibilized okay. and put up. Correct. Perfect. All right. I also saw an email here or a chat about uh, is there an email to send certificates of attendance to obtain credit towards licensing? Um, yeah, I saw that one from Rick. Thank you. Um, we do not accept certificates of attendance as uh, evidence of licensing. We have a process by which uh, all approved training providers are required to upload their rosters for every training within two weeks um, into our system automatically and then it shows up it's assigned to your name based on your license number and it shows up on your licensing training page um, so if if you are not seeing your license your license i mean sorry your continuing education training or your initial course training um, I recommend you reach out to our licensing group and I'm again I'm gonna it, we can get it in the notes but the phone number that you can call to get an answer from one of our staff um, all day they answer all day every day is 512-239-6133 or for uh, an email response, you can send an email to licenses at tceq.texas.gov. Um, we do have several training providers who take a little bit longer than two weeks to get the stuff uploaded, but that is how we determine. We need verification from the training provider, and so that's how we determine when a course has been completed. OK, thank you. Those are the sure. only um, questions I saw as of now, but um, OK, if you won't, if you don't mind sharing that, that uh, searching for people, I will I'm make sure gonna, that that's yeah, the I have a group. couple of links that I will add, um, but I'll go ahead and turn my camera off and mute myself and put those in the chat. I will be following the chat. Um, for the rest of the afternoon, well, and for the rest of the meeting, so if more questions come up, you can certainly put those in there and, and I'll do my best to respond to them in the chat. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Sure. All right, folks. Um, thank you to Shannon. Our, our next presenter is going to be Mr. Alfonso Fuentes from the Office of Compliance and Enforcement with their updates. Sorry, Al, we're, we're getting uh, a uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks kind of sound from you. Um, if you can try again, if not, might have to uh, leave and rejoin. Michelle, it looks like he jumped out. Maybe a good idea okay. to to just move to to Joel, and we'll catch yep. out when he comes back. Hey, oh, Michelle, I'm, I'm back. If I if you can hear me, okay. Oh, I can, and you sound fantastic. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Sorry, I had obviously some audio problems there. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much for having me on. My name is Al Fuentes. I am the uh, water liaison in the program support section. Um, I have a short update on. Uh, OCE and what's going on. Some of, I'll cover some of the bigger projects that are happening. We're reviewing the uh, the FY22 work plan for the regions, uh, which investigations they're going to conduct and when. Um, that, as you might imagine, is a pretty big deal. Uh, we're trying to uh, allocate them uh, in the right spots throughout the FY22. Um, there are some changes made to seeds. Um, 
the Consolidated Compliance and Enforcement Database System, um, which is used to track the CCIs, the investigations. And so there's some testing going on of this database right now to make sure that the changes and upgrades that they made um, aren't impeding the proper functioning of SEEDS. Um, and I'm sure as with the rest of the agency, um, a lot of work going on with the legislature, uh, monitoring some of the hearings and uh, following some of the bills. And uh, finally, the uh, CCIs continue to be conducted virtually uh, and or by conducting a, a record review. Um, there are occasions where the investigators go out to conduct uh, the investigation in person when all of the uh, the COVID precautions can be taken place. Um, that's those are the broad strokes of what's going on in OCE. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if there's anybody have any. All right, thank you, Al. I've go ahead and put a question in there. Give us a few moments just to see if anything pops up. If not, uh, we'll have uh, the ability to get with Al and get obtain any information you guys might need. I'm going to try to stick around for the for the rest of the meeting. All right, we have a question for Mr. Rick Phelan. Um, are you still doing boots on the ground inspections? Can a facility request no in person CCI due to safety? They they can. Uh, uh, boots on the ground is an option if all the COVID precautions can be take can be taken and. Uh, both the uh, the PW, the public water system and the investigators are comfortable with uh, with those precautions, but right now, for the most part, the the investigations are being conducted through a record review, uh, where the records are provided to the investigator electronically, and then anything that's need to be done virtually, they can they if they want to send pictures in things like that, those are those are also useful in these uh, CCIs due to the COVID. OK, there is a question on here that uh, a uh, re regulated entity submitted paperwork for two virtual CCIs on March the 1st, but have not heard back from the inspector. Um, this is for the Midland region. When can they expect to hear something? That I have no control over you. The best way to, to get a good answer for you is to contact the regional office um, and contact the person that you submitted that information to. They um, as you imagine, things might be a little bit crazy, so they may need more time. But in order to get a good date for you, I would recommend that you contact contact at the, the Midland Regional Office. Thank you, Al. And, and for those of you, those of you who do not know, there is a functionality on our web page to just put in TCEQ Regional Office, and you can choose by your county or by your region and find uh, the correct contact number for the water programs. Um, that'll be up to date and uh, ready for somebody to answer the phone and answer your question. We also have a question for Mary Domsek. Uh, what is the current turnaround time for an agreed order or a SEP to be processed? Is that question for me? Uh, I, it probably is, but at the same time, um, for, for those of you who don't know, um, there the Office of Compliance of Enforcement is uh, kind of separated out into the people who actually do the, um, oh, for wastewater. Uh, we definitely don't have the answer to that. Um, just no. uh, sorry. The, uh, yeah, that's something we could we could reach out to um, the enforcement division about, um, but they are a separate division from the the field and program support division that Al works with. So, um, Mary, I'll go ahead and pin that question and see if we can get an answer for you. OK. Any other questions or concerns? All right. Well, thank you, Al. And uh, if anybody else has more questions, feel free to enter them into the chat. We'll try to get back to them later. But for okay. now, the next group on our agenda are going to be the plan and technical review se section with Mr. Joel Klump representing. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Uh, joining me is Dorothy Young, also within my section, and she'll be talking in a little bit to give some updates on capacity development. I'd like to um, highlight a couple pieces of information from my section. As always, there is information available in the um, DWOG staff summary uh, updates, which are available through the DWOG webpage. 
Um, so most of the information that I'll cover this morning is available there. I'd like to start by reminding folks uh, about something that we discussed back in October of 2020 at the October DWAG meeting. And this information specifically impacts all public water systems with surface water treatment plants, which use low pressure membranes for pathogen removal. TCEQ determined that a change was needed in reporting requirements for these systems. All systems with this type of treatment process must regularly pass a direct integrity test to prove the membrane units can remove pathogens. TCEQ has changed one of the pressure values that must be reported on the Surface Water Monthly Operating Report, or SWMOR ALT. TCEQ developed an updated version of the SWMOR ALT for this change, and all membrane plants must begin using the updated version and reporting the changed pressure value by April 1st of this year. A letter explaining this change was mailed to these water systems back on October 16th. Additionally, to help water systems that are impacted by this change, TCEQ offered trainings for membrane plants. Those began in November and wrapped up last month. The trainings were virtual, and in those trainings, TCEQ staff explained the reason for the change, addressed future DIT requirements, answered questions, and covered data requirements for membrane plants. The new version of the SWMOR ALT is available on the TCEQ website. So to summarize, all water systems that use low pressure membranes for pathogen removal must begin using the updated SWMOR ALT for April 2021, and that SWMOR is required to be submitted by May 10th. Um, additionally, those water systems should complete TCEQ form 20889, and this form certifies that the facility reported the lowest pressure during each DIT and, provided verif and provides verification data. If any membrane surface water treatment plant has questions about this, you can reach out either to our surface water treatment rule program or to my section. And after I finish with my update, I'll put those two email addresses in the meeting chat. OK, moving on, a couple additional items. Um, I've been talking at each recent DWAG meeting about the Drinking Water Infrastructure Needs Survey. The survey is ongoing. TCEQ staff has completed review of a few system surveys that have been completed by TCEQ's FMT contractor. PWS participation is very important in documenting all needs so if you're a representative for a water system that is included in the survey, please assist the contractor and TCEQ um, and thank you to those water systems that have already helped out in this way. OK, it is time for uh, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund FY22 process. Um, this process is uh, managed by the Texas Water Development Board but TCEQ is involved by receiving and reviewing project information forms and ranking these forms. We then, uh, TCEQ, in, in our ranking process, we use health and compliance factors and then send that information over to the Texas Water Development Board um, who uses our ranking in their annual intended use plan for the DWSRF. And then the last thing that I have before turning this over to Dorothy is just a reminder that um, a subgroup of the Drinking Water Advisory Work Group is the TCQ Cross Connection Control Subcommittee. And this uh, subcommittee meets quarterly, just like the DWAG, and it's actually um, off a month. So the last quarterly meeting of this subcommittee was in March, on March 4th of 2021. Those meetings have also switched to a virtual format 
Um, and we've been seeing good attendance and good discussion by individuals at those meetings. So if you're involved with cross connection control um, and are interested in learning more about this subcommittee or potentially participating in future meetings, please uh, check the TCEQ webpage um, and there is additional information about the subcommittee there. All right, let me pause and uh, turn things over to Dorothy. Dorothy, if you could give us some updates on capacity development, please. Good morning. Um, I've got just two brief updates. One is on the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordination Committee, or TWIC. If you're new to that term, uh, we started about 10 years ago. It's an umbrella organization of regulatory uh, funding and assistance providers. So we have state and federal funding org organizations state and federal uh, regulatory groups like EPA, TCEQ, FEMA is the part of it. We uh, meet every other month virtually now, hosted, we take turns hosting the meetings. And folks who are struggling to identify uh, a funding source, for instance, or how to get organized or what, whether or not they should build their own system or maybe tie in with somebody else, we welcome those folks as guests, and if you're ever interested uh, in the notes, you can see my contact information, and you can contact me, and I can get you on the agenda or ans answer any questions you have. TWIC also has a website hosted by the Water Development Board, and that, that link is in the notes, too. And the next meeting is probably going to be the end of May and hosted by TCQ. We just haven't determined the exact date yet. So that's the update on TWIC. The second thing I wanted to mention is, particularly after the storm, I know a lot of you helped a lot of folks and uh, needed help. So we have a new uh, category in our recognition program for drinking water systems about partnerships. And that's a very broad term. So it could be mentoring, it could be emergency response help, it could be training, uh, sharing equipment, backing each other up, actual taking over another water system, a uh, pretty liberal definition. So you can nominate yourself or someone else, and that link is also on the website. And I'll be glad to answer any questions now, or if you want to shoot me an email, I'll be glad to uh, talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, I'm happy to field any questions now. I will also be here for the remainder of the DWOG meeting. So if you have any, have questions, any questions regarding, regarding the plan and technical review section, you can drop them in the chat and I'll be happy to respond. Thank you, Joel and, Joel and Dorothy. We'll give it just a few moments here. Um, there we go. Uh, is the cross connection subcommittee web page up to date with current meeting schedule? Um, it should be. I did not check that this morning before the meeting to verify that. Um, I can tell you that the next meeting will be in June. Um, but as to whether the web page has the uh, exact date for that, I'm not sure. So Sarah, thank you very much for your question. Let me uh, verify that that is up to date and I'll get back to you and, and post something in the chat. Um, Joel, this is Janelle. I just looked and it is not available yet. OK, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Um, I know that staff try to keep that web page up to date. Um, they certainly post agendas in advance of each quarterly meeting and then as well post uh, meeting minutes following each meeting. Uh, but let me reach out to the staff member who is coordinating the June meeting and um, figure out when information will be updated on that web page so that you can get that on your calendar. All right, thank you very much. I'm not seeing any more questions, but as people said, uh, the um, Joel will be here for the remainder of the meeting. And if you have any questions in the chat, we can also, you know, open back up in in between to to actually answer those questions live if need be. Okay. All right. So the next person uh, to present would be myself, um, Michelle Risco, the manager of the drinking water uh, standard section, and I only have a few updates, and these are kind of um, just really uh, 
good reminders overall, but coming up on uh, this time of year, they're, they're timely things. So um, for those of you who joined in on during the January dwog, thank you very much for, for tuning in. We really focused on the data quality and the processes we use to check your chlorine residuals and obtain and make sure that those disinfectant residuals have good quality and the reporting associated to those. And then likewise on the microbial and coliform reporting. So um, I want to uh, step up for the drinking water assessment team and do a couple of reminders related to the revised total coliform rule. Um, you'll, you'll see this later during our URI lessons learned, but one of the things we really want to emphasize is to sample early and to sample often. Um, so if possible, and you have, you know, say you only have one sample for the month, please take that in the first week of the month. Um, that way you have plenty of opportunities if there's bad weather from that point forward. If you are a system that needs to take 100 samples in a month, um, please, you know, try to make those into manageable amounts, you know, samples of five or 10 per day or um, two or three per day and do those early. You can do them in the first three weeks of the month and give yourself that final week to uh, make any uh, adjustments for weather or for positives. Um, by doing those early in the month, uh, you also get the ability to ensure that your repeats and any triggered source monitoring occurs within the monitoring period within a timely fashion. Uh, I really want to emphasize this for a couple of reasons. One of those is failure to take repeats properly um, and uh, get those taken care of in a timely fashion as required by the rule can actually lead to you having to do a level one assessment, which puts additional work on your water system. We want to avoid that if at all possible. Um, if it's just a matter of being trained and being aware. To facilitate that, I'd also like to take an opportunity to remind people to stay up to date on your sample siting plans. Um, if your sampler goes out and finds out that 101 Main Street and um, it's now under construction or it's been remodeled or demolished and it's not a good place for you to be taking a sample, please ensure that you change it to a more appropriate site and therefore also up, uh, change your upstream and downstream repeat sample sites so that if you were to replace it with 102 Main Street, the location itself and its upstream and downstream sites are all appropriate for sampling. Um, this means, you know, if you get a call from the laboratory saying you have a positive, it's just as quick as going to say, OK, where was it and what are my options? And you can go out and take those three samples that you need to take along with any trigger source monitoring samples you may have. Um, I'd like to go ahead and share my screen with y'all real quick. Um, hopefully you are able to see uh, a drinking water watch page. Um, in this case, I want to make sure that people know that they have the ability to check to make sure that we received their bacteriological samples. So you can search for any water system you like using the water system feature that you're seeing in the top middle, um, the white links at the top. In this case, I've chosen to pick on the city of Round Rock because I live there. Um, in this third column over, you have the option of TCR sample results. By clicking on this, you'll be able to see the results that we have in our database course it's not loading there we go all right so you're going to be able to see all the samples we have for um, that sample and then or for that system and the date that we obtained it so you can look back and see that we have all of these March samples um, the ability to also count how many there are in their case they have to do 100 plus so I'm not going to count for you here but if you only have to do two or five or ten you can quickly scroll and see that we have them here similarly if you were to have a positive, we can click on recent positives and we'll see if they have any recent ones. Here we go. So you can see your positive is going to show up. This one that says routine is going to be your, in, your original positive and then your repeats will show up with repeat. So you can see A, you can confirm exactly which address was positive so that you can get your repeats at the correct location. And then you can also check to make sure that any uh, routine repeats also show up here if you have any other additional positives. So if you had a repeat come up positive, you could then also check its address and make sure you are appropriately taking the repeat samples required from that. Um, 
This is a great way. These are manually entered by my staff as soon as they come in. Your laboratory faxes us on the same day or sends us an email on the same day. So this is a very fast turnaround time. When in doubt, um, we try to avoid documentation issues as much as possible. So um, that's a good place for you to be able to check those things out yourself. Um, join back in here with you guys. I also wanted to spend a little bit of time to remind people that we are coming up on LTR season. I know it doesn't feel like it because it's only April, but when the weather starts to get warm, A, we have more positive bacteriological samples, and B, we're getting ready for reduced monitoring period. So if you are a system that is, this is your year to, to be doing your um, reduced monitoring for lead and copper, please, right now is the time to check your sites. Check to make sure we have the sites you need on file. If you are having to take more than your original, so if you are typically on reduced and you put in a new source, or for some reason you're going up to initial monitoring, where instead of having to do five, you have to do 10, or instead of 50, you have to do 100, please make sure you have a f sufficient number of approved sites. This is a great time to do that before the rush happens and before you're supposed to be out there actually sampling from these locations. It's also a good time to check to make sure that those sites are approved and that you're doing your documentation correctly. Um, unfortunately, we've had quite a few um, violations obtained by people that uh, sampled from unapproved locations that we were unable to take um, or that their documentation was um, incorrect. Things like uh, we were only able to accept nine out of 10 because it looked like they sampled from the same location twice. Um, at the same time. So um, obviously that it's some sort of uh, documentation error. They didn't get from the same home, same homeowner on the same first draw sample on the same day, two times. Um, so please uh, make sure that you are double checking your, your paperwork. Um, go behind your homeowners, make sure that they've done the stagnation time properly. If it looks like it's been stagnant for three weeks because uh, Miss Smith doesn't use her guest bathroom and where that's where she took the sample, um, that's a good sample not to submit. That's a good sample to educate her about what a first draw means and let her know that the, the standard is to sit overnight, but preferably no longer than 18 hours. Um, not only does it benefit you because you're unlikely to have uh, an errantly large result, but it also benefits them because uh, the, the result will be meaningful and truthful. So please take this opportunity to look at your sites early. Um, I did want to also share on Drinking Water Watch where y'all can check this out. So for, um, once again, we're gonna be in the city of Round Rock, but if you look on the far left-hand column here, in the middle is gonna be sample schedules, panels, and plans. If you click on that, you'll be able to see all your sampling schedules for all the different things we require either you to take or for us to take on your behalf. Um, here is a little link that not everybody knows and I highly encourage you to become aware of, expanded sample schedules, panels, and plans. By clicking that, it'll reload this page and it'll give you additional details. So for instance, here on lead and copper rule, it says when your next sampling is due and instead of just having this reduced monitoring over here and the continuous, which sometimes confuses people, it tells you exactly. They are not due until between June 1st and September 30th of 2023. So please check, be sure to take a look, check those out, make sure that, that, that you know um, what your monitoring period is and I also like to emphasize that sampling needs to be taken during the monitoring period. You cannot sample early and you cannot sample late. So please make sure you know what your monitoring period and you sample within that uh, time period. Regrettably, we've had to um, reject uh, some samples because they are taken in an invalid time frame. So please make sure that you uh, are aware of those options and that you can, can look for this information. Um, and if you have any questions, we always are available to answer any concerns you might have. All right. And then I also just wanted to, to jump on for um, the DLQOR for the disinfectant level quarterly operating report. Those were due uh, by the 10th. Um, it is now the 13th. But if by any chance you didn't turn yours in yet, please feel free to um, use our online E2 reporting functionality and get those submitted as soon as possible um, so we can resolve any violations you might have earned. And more importantly, so that we know what kind of disinfectant you have going out to your folks and that they are protected. One last thing that I wanted to cover is um, the Antea third party contract, um, the people who come out and help you assist with your chemical sampling. Um, we pretty regularly uh, hear after the fact that people have offline or inactive 
entry points or facilities. Um, and they mentioned it to the sampler, but they never told us. Um, the sampler does not have access to our database. Therefore, if you have an entry point that's temporarily offline because you're reworking a well or um, updating treatment um, or it's seasonal and you're not using it for that quarter, please make sure to let us know. Um, the email, and I'll include it in the chat here, is pwschem at tceq.texas.gov. And in order to um, prove that it is inactive or offline, we'll need well logs or meter logs that show no production for the monitoring time period. So please, if you know it gets to the end of the second quarter and you didn't use the uh, facility within the second quarter, um, provide that documentation to us at that email address and we can avoid sending an errant uh, monitoring and reporting violation to you that we would later have to reject based on this, this communication. So if you can communicate to us early, we'll take care of it. It'll never become an issue. Those are the main things I had here. Let me go ahead back and see. I think we had some questions. Uh, Charles Brewer, is TCEQ able to conduct a virtual webinar to go over the lead and copper rule revisions and highlight the new requirements? Yes, um, but you're actually uh, tuning in early. Uh, this morning at 10 a.m., we will be doing an LCRR overview and update um, with the requirements as they are in the proposed yet final again uh, rule. Um, it has it is under another review um, and has been delayed at this point, but Laura will cover that for you. So yes, we're going to do a large overview now and then eventually in the future um, as it becomes truly final, we'll have more um, presentations available to you all. One final thing, um, and this does kind of tie into the disinfectant level quarterly operating reports. The main compliance officer associated to that um, is temporarily out on military leave. If you have any questions and you previously emailed Bonnie Evans, please make sure to use our main DBP at tceq.texas.gov email or um, feel free to call uh, the main line and uh, let them know that you're having issues with the LQOR and that way it will get forward to a staff member who is present until she is back. Um, Nicole Howell asked, when are those due? OK, so basically for all of our reporting requirements, whenever the monitoring period closes, you have till 10 days of the following month. So in the case of quarterly, so disinfectant level quarterly operating reports, you have till 10 days after the end of the quarter. So January, February, March, March 31st was the end of the quarter. You have until April the 10th. Same thing happens if it's uh, annual monitoring period. That means it's done on December 31st, which means you have until January the 10th to get us the data. So for so, uh, so on and so forth um, for all of our uh, reporting requirements. Okay. Okay, Michelle, if, there's a, an additional question. If you go up oh, a little sorry, bit further it. at 937 from Jack Gibbons. Okay, let me scroll. 937. Ah, there we go. What is best for this question as a board member? Okay, so questions about PFOA and PFOS. Um, at this point in time, PFO and PFOS are unregulated contaminants. Um, the TCEQ does not require for you to monitor for those, neither does the EPA. Um, there are some PFO and PFOS that are going to be included, uh, were included in the previous unregulated contaminant rule, and there are more in the upcoming unregulated contaminant rule, but you would only have results if you are one of the um, water systems selected um, for that sampling by the EPA. This is a rule that the TCQ does not have primacy over. Um, so uh, that's something that you would check with EPA on to see whether you're part of that sampling. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't have any testing for that, nor are we, uh, you know, not. it's not in the rule at this time. Uh, the only time we would be adding that probably would be is if the EPA were to promulgate a rule in the future, which is unknown because it's the future. Um, if you uh, choose to do testing on your own, obviously you uh, you have the ability to do that. We'd ask that you you share any um, results you have with your people as required by the consumer confidence rule. Um, and if you're interested in any uh, publicly available data, the data from the um, UCMR or unregulated contaminant monitoring rule um, is available on EPA's website for download, and you can check to see if anyone in your area um, has had any detects. 
sorry, I see. OK, all right. I hope that answered the questions. Um, obviously, I will continue to be here if you have any future questions or further questions. With that said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Steven Swaringa for his presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Um, my name is Steven Swaringa. I'm the uh, section manager for the drinking water special functions section. Um, and I've got a couple of updates. These updates are out of the program updates, but just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, but I want to start with some happy news, um, which is that uh, we've added James Lamana to our team. He's now the uh, uh, team leader for the drinking water technical review team. Uh, he's a, a welcome addition. He's a terrific uh, project manager and leader, and I'm very excited to have him uh, come over uh, and join us in this section. Uh, James started in the drinking water standards section as a contractor and, and rose through the ranks uh, as an FTE. Um, and so I'm very, very pleased to have his expertise um, over on, on this side of things. So uh, welcome to you, James. Um, and uh, if, if there are things data related or enforcement related, um, you, of course, you can contact me, uh, but James Lamana can also help you with those questions. Uh, on to other news. Um, this has been a banner month for boil water notices. Um, in fact, we had excuse me, a banner quarter. Uh, we've had more boil water notices in this quarter uh, than we usually have in an entire year. Um, and so I'd like to uh, take a moment to commend all the, the folks in my section and, and really the entire uh, division and OCE that really helped to um, respond to all of those things and to coordinate with you all. Um, it was a tremendous effort. Um, and so um, thank you all for that. And um, I'm almost all of this boil water notices have been lifted uh, actually all of them related to the winter storm and um, there are a few others that are are lingering um and so we're we're happy to help you with any of those things as well um in other news um we have the public drinking water conference coming up in uh in august um the dates are set for august 10th and 11th uh registration will be um in mid-May um, and so if you have questions related to that please um, feel free to reach out to Mason um, but don't reach out to Mason because uh, Mason uh, um, doesn't can't do any kind of registration yet um, and so um, we will be reaching out to some of you all to um, seek your participation um, if there are things that you'd like to um, participate in or talk about uh, we'd be very interested in hearing from you on that you can definitely reach out to Mason about um, and then um, one other bit of news is that our CCR generator um, is up and running. Um, and so um, we have Erin Kent Poole here today uh, and she'll be speaking about um, the public, or excuse me, the uh, CCR. Um, and so um, I, I will reserve any additional comments related to the CCR um, for her and, and during her, her session. Um, that's all I have. I see that there's uh, some questions here. Uh, at least one that I see is: Will the um, will the um, uh, PDW be a, a hybrid um, of a live and uh, virtual? At this point, we're still uh, making decisions about how we're going to do that, um, and so um, I don't have an answer for you at this time. Were there any other questions? It doesn't look like it, so thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate it, and that's all, if that's all you had, um, we'll go for uh, go to Jessica Hulk real quick for a quick uh, QA update. Jessica, are you available? All right, can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Awesome. Well, my name is Jessica Hoke, and I am the Quality Assurance Officer for the Public Water System Supervision Program. And so I'm just here to give a few quick updates on sort of what the uh, QA uh, program is focusing on right now. Um, <clears throat> so I think this highlights what I've talked about in previous DWOG meetings. We are continuing to focus on timely and accurate reporting of data for compliance. As we identify issues that come up with either the accuracy or the timeliness of the reporting, labs are contacted to discuss the nonconformance to the quality assurance project plan requirements and where appropriate we're issuing corrective actions. One issue that has been coming up 
um, repeatedly has been related to lead and copper and water quality parameter data. So kind of to echo off of some of the information that Michelle provided, I highly encourage public water system operators and owners to ask for more information from their laboratories regarding the reporting and also to just take some proactive steps to ensure that your data has been reported and is accurate to your, the best of your knowledge. So some questions that you could ask your lab while dropping off your samples would be, when can I expect the results for these samples? Um, when can I expect these results to be reported to the TCEQ? So that way you'll have an idea of when you can then confirm that those results were successfully reported by reviewing the data on Drinking Water Watch, similar to how Michelle um, kind of walked you all through earlier. Something else that I would highly encourage you all to do is to confirm that the results were accurately reported on Drinking Water Watch based off of the uh, analysis report that should have been provided to you. Because in all of these processes, we're humans and occasionally errors come up and it's definitely best to work proactively to find these issues rather than reactively because the compliance impacts when there are any issues with data reporting, either the timeliness or the accuracy of it, those impacts generally fall on the public water systems. So another thing to kind of again echo off of what Michelle had talked about earlier, if there are any issues with your samples and their data, and it's not determined until after the monitoring period has been completed, that monitoring period is gone. And oftentimes samples cannot be recollected to provide compliance with that monitoring period because the monitoring period, like I said, is gone. So an example would be issues with the reduced monitoring period for lead and copper. Um, that monitoring period is between June and the end of September. So if you're waiting until September to take your samples and then you don't realize that there was an issue for whatever reason with them, but you don't find out until October, it's too late to recollect your samples. So to sort of reiterate that message about sampling early, um, definitely try and collect your samples early in any monitoring period that you're collecting for. Um, so again, like I said, the compliance impacts can fall on the public water systems, and so it is best to act proactively in regards to your data rather than reactively because there can be the compliance impacts of violations that would fall again on the public water system. Um, so that was pretty much what I had an update for. If you all have any questions, I will be available here for the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Thanks. Jessica. I wanted to share one thing real quick, uh, just so you guys know. I didn't show, I didn't share this during our time, but uh, here on Drinking Water Watch, same thing. Um, your ability to check that your samples are received. So if you are in your water system and you go over here to the right hand side and it says PBCU, which for those of you who don't know, that's shorthand for lead and copper. You can click summaries. And it's going to bring up this page. It'll give you your monitoring period and it'll give you your uh, number of samples collected. And, and any action level exceeding samples you might have for that time period. So in this case, their requirement was 100. They submitted 102. They're going to be fine. Um, however, if they were supposed to submit, you know, 10 and this says 9, then they need to get in contact with us or the laboratory to figure out why we only have 9 of their 10 or 50 of their 100 or 75 of their 100. So please make sure to take a look at this um, and and you can see the number you have here and you go back to where we talked about sample schedules earlier and you can see the number you have to take, which now they're down to 50 because they were on initial and now they're on routine, but they can see how many they have to take. So this next time around, if we only have 49 out of their 50, they should be calling us. So please, uh, you know, use the tools at your disposal. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. But these are things that you can double check your laboratories on and then also uh, make sure that, that, like she said, the data is correct. If it shows on there that you had two action level exceeders or uh, unique sites that had an, a value greater than the action level, and that's not what you saw on your paperwork that came back from the laboratory, please reach out to us. That's very important information to know. And we are human. Sometimes it's just a matter of typing something in incorrectly. But the better, better to find it earlier, so that nobody has unnecessary work. You guys don't have to tell anything to your to your customers that's not correct. Don't have to tell anything to your shareholders, your board, whomever that is incorrect. Um, we get it taken care of. 
get it cleaned up and we can just keep on moving forward with the protected health of our citizens. Um, thank you very much, Jessica. I appreciate it. And the next one we have is uh, Brittany. Hey, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It looks like there is a question that came in um, from DT Hensel. So from the laboratory side, have any updates or talks happened yet about a new or updated way of submitting the lead and copper and WQP results to the TCEQ? So at this time, we don't have any immediate changes going on. To any laboratories who are on the in the meeting right now, I do want to say, and specifically to the lead and copper data and also your WQP data that's submitted to the LCR data mailbox, you should always be getting an automatic bounce back that says that that email has been received. If for whatever reason you're not receiving that bounce back when you're submitting data, then something went wrong in our ability to receive it. And so I encourage you to reach out to the lead and copper program so that we can investigate into that. Um, so that's sort of a, a solution that we've got in the moment for some of the issues that have come up. For going forward in the future, um, we are looking into and submitting some uh, a grant request to create or to be a part of the compliance monitoring data portal. And I think that this is something that Michelle or Steven could talk in more detail about, but at this point it's just at the step of submitting the application. So there is no actual updates to provide on that aside from we are actively taking steps to look for another way to submit the data. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, not to speak for Stephen, but we are looking into options. We did hear that that is a concern that you all have, and we would like to be able to get you a, a better tool. Um, unfortunately, that's not something we can just go pick off the shelf at Walmart. Um, so we are looking into it, um, and uh, I don't want you to get your hopes up that it's going to be really soon. Um, but we did hear that concern, and we are looking into it. Yes, thank you. You spoke for me very well, Michelle. I would just add that um, you know this is a it's a multi year uh, process, um, but we we are um, exploring and looking into how we can we can move to another tool. So uh, it's definitely on our on our radar. All right, thank you guys very much, and and appreciate to all of you who um, who did attend that and did give us feedback. Um, it is always valuable to hear from. The stakeholders because we, we do try to interact with water systems on a regular basis but the laboratories are an extremely important part of that process all right i know we're running a little bit behind my apologies on that but i would like to go ahead and finish the morning session with miss Brittany wortham teakel to have a uh, discussion about the winter storm project Brittany, hello let me um see if i can share a few placeholder um slides that i have does everyone see that opening slide i can see it fine thank you Brittany. okay i'm gonna have to minimize everything so i can read this off so please stop me if something goes wrong <laughs> all right so good morning everyone um like michelle said i'm Brittany wortham teakle special assistant for the plane and technical review section I'm here this morning to briefly discuss the impacts from the winter storm URI that came through Texas the week of February 14th, 2021, and to offer a brief explanation of our planned response. During this storm, public water systems experienced water outages and other emergency conditions that required a significant number of systems to issue boil water notices. Due to the widespread loss of electricity, many systems were unable to adequately treat water or pump treated water into the distribution system. This also created a cascading effect that required the systems that purchased treated water and only consist of distribution systems to issue boil water notices. Systems with generators of all sizes encountered mechanical failures due to the freezing temperatures and icy conditions. For the systems that were able to send treated water to the distribution system, they also encountered, encountered multiple issues from frozen or broken water lines to increased customer demand. Increased demand resulted from customers dripping or running taps to prevent freezing, as well as filling large containers for emergency personal use, and the loss of water when lines broke or froze. Additionally, some system employees were not able to access their water treatment plants to evaluate damage, start generators, or conduct mitigation actions because of the hazardous road conditions caused by ice and downed trees and power lines. These emergency conditions, along with the extended power outages, resulted in the systems reporting approximately thousand boil water notices issued during the week of the storm. Nearly 40% of the state's community public water systems issued a boil water notice that week. 
approximately 80% or 1,545 of the systems serve a population of less than 3,300. About 57% or 888 of the small systems serve a population of less than 500. Rules and regulations currently require certain types of public water systems to provide emergency power. Of all the systems that issued a bull water notice, approximately 55% or 1,103 of the systems are subject to emergency power and or emergency preparedness plan requirements. So during the March 3rd commission work session, agency staff were tasked to conduct an after action review to evaluate the factors that impacted so many public water systems during the storm event. To kick off the project, we have formed an interdisciplinary team made up of staff members from the Office of Water and the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. The project team will collect information to gain deeper understanding of the challenges faced by public water systems due to the storm and evaluate the resources in place to assist systems in increasing their resiliency. The project team, the project team will engage stakeholders from both the private and public sectors to discuss a variety of topics that may offer insights to further enhance and integrate critical infrastructure resilience. Our goal is to improve public health and safety through the deployment of response and recovery actions that will mitigate risks posed by catastrophic weather related events. Some of these issues that the team will explore will include the adequacy of emergency power resources and other critical infrastructure, the evaluation of system design standards relating to weatherization, equipment inventory and maintenance procedures, rules and regulations regulations relating to water system resilience, conservation efforts during high customer demand times, chemical and fuel supplies, communication pathways and boil water notice procedures, alternative sources for water supply and distribution, agency response and assistance efforts, and conducting functional exercises on emergency response actions. The project team has already begun working on, on developing an in-depth public water system survey to be sent to every public water system. We hope that this will help the team collect information about the storm's impact from the systems. The survey will be designed to identify the procedures systems utilize to prepare for, respond to, and recover from the storm. The project team will also conduct roundtable discussions from uh, across the state to create a platform of open dialogue with a variety of stakeholders. These discussions will help us to identify the key issues that, lead to, that led to cascading failures across critical infrastructure and those that affected the restoration of services. The project team will conduct a review of rules and regulations, including regulations from other states relating to the weatherization of water system facilities. We will also review current literature to identify best practices to enhance public water system resilience. Agency staff will conduct presentations, case studies, and lessons learned, training and emergency preparedness, and planning at the PDW conference. So um, once we conclude these tasks, we will analyze the information we obtained during each step of the process and will present our findings and suggested recommendations for the commissioner's consideration. Recommendations may include regulatory, statutory, additional training and guidance needs or changes to the agency processes or address the challenges uh, to address the challenges experienced by systems during the storm. We will also present any recommended actions that the agency can take to better assist public water systems during these types of catastrophic events. This project will take place over the course of the next year. So my information is included. If you have any questions or concerns, we plan to mail a postcard to each PWS by the end of this month with a link that will lead you to the survey. We respectfully request that if you uh, that you all please take the survey and provide the most honest answers possible. The more information we receive through the questionnaire, the better data we will have for uh, to for knowing how to structure roundtable discussions and will allow us to make the most appropriate recommendations to our commissioners in the summary of findings at the end of the project. I ask that you email the winterstorm underscore PWS at tceq.texas.gov email if you would like to be involved in any roundtable discussions or um, as a stakeholder or if you have any questions regarding the questionnaire. My personal contact information is available on this slide as well, um, and I am happy to answer any questions. It's still the beginning of the project, so I may not have an answer for everything at this point, but um, let me know if you do have questions. Thank you, Brittany. I'm not seeing any questions, um, but uh, feel free to include any that you might have um, in the chat. Otherwise, that 
concludes the beginning of our or concludes the um, morning portion or the, the introductory portion of our agenda. Um, go ahead and, and we'll have a five minute break and come back at 1015 and restart on our agenda at the LCRR overview and update. Feel free, like I said, as we're on break uh, to get up, stretch your legs and also include any questions you may have in the chat. Thank you very much.
All right, folks. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, I appreciate uh, your attention this morning. And I believe that uh, this next presentation is going to be one that really uh, you probably were tuning in for in the first place. So we will have uh, Ms. Laura Higgins, who is the team leader of the Drinking Water Assessment Team, give us an overview of the lead and copper rule revisions. And uh, Vera Poe will also chime in with some very helpful information on where to get started and how to get started. Laura, thank you very much. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here. I hope that's showing up uh, okay for everybody. All right, uh, yeah, good morning everyone. Um, like Michelle said, my name is Laura Higgins and I'm the team lead for the drinking water assessment team here uh, within the water supply division here at the TCEQ. Um, today, I'd like to give just a general overview of the new revisions to the lead and copper rule program that came out in December of 2020 uh, and were published in the Federal Register in January of 2021. Uh, before I even begin, I just want to preface that the rule is currently undergoing review due to President Biden's executive orders. And on March 10th, the EPA issued a press release proposing to extend the effective dates and requesting additional input on the LCRR. Um, so I'm going to present to the best of my ability, but know that there are still things that are subject to change. Um, all right, so what I'd like to do is give a, a, a brief background on the lead and copper rule and then discuss some highlights of the final revision um, and then go into some of the details within the final rule. Um, and then finally, we can talk about some of the next steps to take. So originally published in 1991, the lead and copper rule applies to approximately 68,000 community and non-transient, non-community public water systems serving over 300 million people nationwide. And in Texas specific, oh, excuse me, specifically, there are approximately 5,500 public water systems that are subject to the LCR regulation. Uh, the lead and copper rule is a treatment technique regulation rather than an MCL, and it requires water systems to take actions to reduce exposure um, to the extent feasible. Uh, lead is generally not naturally found in water. Um, rather, lead from lead pipes, faucets, and fixtures can dissolve into water um, or sometimes can enter as particles. So in order to keep lead from entering the water, uh, the rule requires that some systems um, are required to treat water using certain chemicals that keep the lead in place by reducing corrosion. And when corrosion control alone is not sufficient to control lead exposure, systems are required to educate the public about risks of lead in drinking water and to replace the lead service lines. So the goal of the new revision is to build off of the current lead and copper rule and to strengthen it in order to better protect children and our communities. Um, the three main aims are to better protect uh, children at schools and childcare facilities, to get the lead out of our, out of our nation's drinking water by um, including uh, improvements to the lead service line replacements, and three, empower communities through information so that consumers can take steps to reduce their lead exposure. So with the first goal to better protect children at schools and child care facilities, systems will now be required to test at elementary schools and child care facilities. Uh, to define some of these terms, Child care facility means a location that houses a licensed provider of child care, day care, or early learning services to children as, as determined by the state, local, or tribal licensing agency. A school 
means any building associated with public, private, or charter institutions that primarily provides teaching and learning for elementary or secondary students. And an elementary school means a school classified as elementary by state and local practice and is composed of any span of grades, including preschool, uh, not above grade eight. And with the new rule, these facilities must conduct testing uh, over a five year period, testing 20% of facilities each year. After five years, they'll continue to receive annual outreach uh, and will have the opportunity to be tested for lead by the system on request. And secondary schools can re request testing at any time. So for goal two, to get the lead out of our nation's drinking water, uh, water systems will adjust sampling sites to better target locations with lead service lines. Systems will follow new improved tap sampling procedures and collect water in contact with lead service line, um, i.e. The, the fifth liter, uh, and, and systems will, uh, will sample more frequently um, for systems with higher, higher levels. Sorry, I think I said that poorly. Systems with higher levels will sample more frequently. Um, so based on sampling results, systems with elevated lead levels will reevaluate their existing corrosion control treatment um, or conduct a treatment study so that they are prepared uh, to respond quickly when necessary. Systems will have to pay attention to individual locations with elevated levels of lead uh, by identifying the cause and uh, mitigating the problem uh, using a find and fix approach. And flexibility is important for small systems so that they can protect public health by taking the action that makes sense for their community. Um, for the first time, systems are going to be required to develop a public lead service line inventory and create a plan for removing lead service lines. Um, systems above the trigger level of 10 parts per billion are going to be required to work with the state to set an annual goal for replacing lead service lines. Uh, water systems above the action level of 15 parts per billion will be required to fully replace a minimum of 3% of the number of known or potential lead service lines annually. Um, and importantly, the proposal prohibits test outs to avoid replacing lead service lines, uh, which was an allowed practice under the previous rule um, that has significantly slowed the, the national progress in removing uh, the significant source of lead from homes. All right, the third goal of empowering our communities. Um, so with this goal, homeowners will learn about elevated levels of lead in their home or system sooner. They'll also understand where lead service lines are in their community and how to protect their family from exposure to lead in drinking water. And water systems will also uh, notify homeowners and building owners about opportunities to replace lead service lines, including information about uh, financial assistance programs. So now I want to touch on some of the other technical details within the lead and copper rule revision, such as the uh, lead trigger level, tap sampling, corrosion control treatment, find and fix, lead service line inventory and replacement plan, small system flexibility, notification and public education, and again, um, the sampling and education at schools and child care facilities. So the LCRR establishes a new trigger level at 10 micrograms per liter, which is in addition to the current action level of 15 micrograms per liter. Water systems that exceed the trigger level, but not the action level, 
uh, will not qualify for reduced monitoring and must sample annually at the standard number of sites. Additionally, um, they must implement a goal based lead service line replacement program, conduct annual outreach to lead service line customers, implement a corrosion control study if corrosion control treatment is not already installed and re-optimize their treatment if corrosion control treatment is already installed. All right, tap sampling. Under the revised rule, the tap sample site tiering criteria uh, has been revised to emphasize sampling from lead service line sites. The new tiering also recategorizes copper pipes um, with lead solder sites, uh, regardless of their age. So there's also a change to how samples um, are used to calculate the 90th percentile. For systems with lead service lines, 100% of the tap sampling must come from the lead service line sites, and all samples must be used to calculate the 90th percentile for lead. There's also been a change in the TAP sample collection protocol. So for all lead service lines, the fifth liter must now be collected. And additionally, systems will now be prohibited from including instructions to remove and clean aerators or to conduct pre-stagnation flushing prior to the start uh, of the required uh, stagnation period. And further, Systems must now supply uh, samplers or uh, consumers um, with wide mouth bottles to collect tap samples. Um, and finally, for monitoring, systems must now uh, have lower lead levels longer in order to go on reduced monitoring. Systems above the trigger level but below the action level must monitor at least annually and are not eligible for reduced triennial monitoring. Systems above the action level must monitor every six months with results at or below the action level for two years. Also, systems with a new uh, source water or long-term treatment change must monitor every six months. Okay. Corrosion control treatment under the LCRR requires systems with optimized corrosion control to re-optimize if, if the 90th percentile lead level exceeds the trigger level or the action level. It also requires systems without optimized corrosion control study um, to study OCCT uh, if the 90th percentile exceeds the trigger level and implement OCCT if the action level is exceeded. As part of the study, the rule requires that systems should evaluate an orthophosphate-based inhibitor as a uh, corrosion control and established um, additional specifications for water systems to study alternative corrosion control. Um, it also requires systems to conduct a find and fix for individual sites that exceed 15 micrograms per liter. So this is different uh, than the current or previous um, lead and copper rule, which required systems serving greater than 50,000 people to begin optimized corrosion control uh, between 1994 and 1998. And also that systems serving less than 50,000 people must begin the optimized corrosion control process when the system exceeds an action level. So, like I said, the LCRR now implements a find and fix approach. Um, systems must collect a follow up sample for each lead tap sample site that exceeds 15 micrograms per liter within 30 days of learning the results. And systems will be required to report these results to the state but the results will not be included in the lead 90th percentile calculation. Systems with CCT will be required to collect an additional WQ, 
WQP sample at or near the site where the high, le high lead sample was collected within five days of learning of the lead results. And at this time, systems must determine if a fix is needed. So um, this could be an adjustment to the CCT, flushing portions of the distribution system, uh, or other strategies. And additionally, systems that identify a fix that is out of their control, such as uh, premise plumbing, must provide documentation to the state. So at the time of publication uh, in the Federal Register, uh, and remember those dates are, are subject to change, water systems must prepare an initial lead service line inventory by January 16th of 2024 that identifies uh, lead service lines, lead status um, of unknown service lines, galvanized lines requiring replacement, and non-lead service lines. Um, additionally, uh, lead connectors such as uh, goosenecks or uh, pigtails are not required to be included in the inventory. And also, systems must update the inventory annually or triannually if the system is on reduced monitoring. So, um, lead service lines. Um, uh, for the replacement plan, systems with lead service lines must prepare a lead service line replacement program, um, a program plan by January 16th, 2024. Again, remember these dates could change. Um, and this removes the test out provision uh, to avoid replacing lead service lines. Um, and additionally, partial lead service line replacements will no longer be allowed. So for water systems serving greater than 10,000 people, um, they can uh, stop the, the goal-based lead service line replacement when a system is below the trigger level for two consecutive monitoring periods. Um, additionally, systems serving greater than 10,000 uh, that exceed the lead action level uh, will fully replace annually 3% of lead service lines um, based on a rolling two-year average. Um, again, under the previous or the current LCR, systems that exceed the lead action level after installing CCT must replace 7% of uh, lead service lines per year systems are only required to replace the portion of the lead service line owned by the PWS. Systems uh, may consider a lead service line replacement if a sample um, from that line is below the action level. Systems must offer to replace customer owned portions at, a, at customer cost. And lead service line replacement can stop when um, the lead is below the action level for two consecutive monitoring periods. So uh, quite a bit of changes based on what's currently written. So small system flexibility applies to community systems serving 10,000 people or fewer um, and all non-transient non-community systems. So water systems with a lead trigger level uh, will recommend a compliance option and obtain agency approval. And if a water system uh, subsequently exceeds the lead action level, it must implement the approved option. All right, so for notification and public education, systems must conduct public notification to consumers within 24 hours of a 90th percentile lead level above the action level. Uh, systems must also provide notice to customers whose individual tap sample is greater than 15 micrograms per liter within three days. And additionally, 
uh, water systems with lead service lines that exceed the trigger level will be required to conduct annual outreach to lead service line customers. Um, further uh, public education um, should be delivered to impacted customers during uh, water related work that may disturb any lead service lines and um, Revision to the Consumer Confidence Report uh, health effects language, availability of the lead service line inventory and report of the range of the tap sample levels um, and uh, should also provide public access to tap sample results. And again, to compare that to the uh, previous or current lead and copper rule, um, so currently systems must provide education material in the annual consumer confidence report. Systems with a 90th percentile greater than the action level must pr uh, provide public education and outreach to customers about lead exposure and additional information sources. And systems must provide lead consumer notice to individuals served um, at test taps within 30 days of learning results. All right, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, to revisit it again, uh, the last item is sampling and education at schools and child care facilities. So the new rule requires systems to develop a list of customers and service connections that provide water to schools uh, or licensed child care providers and verify this list every five years. Uh, for the first five years, a um, a community water system will collect samples at 20% of elementary schools and 20% of child care facilities um, from the list each year. And after one round of five years of sampling, then systems can sample on request um, at elementary school and child care facilities. Um, Additionally, um, with the new rule, there's a provision to provide uh, sampling results to the sampled facility, um, the primacy agency, uh, the state and the local health departments, um, and annually certify to the primacy agency that it met the notification and sampling requirements. So uh, the next steps, like I said, um, at the very beginning, the the lead and copper rule, the revision to the lead and copper rule was published in the Federal Register on January 15th of 2021. Um, however, since that time, there have been uh, executive orders and even a uh, press release from EPA to uh, review the LCRR. Um, and there's uh, part of the EPA's press release um, requested uh, public comment. So, uh, so some of the, the effective and implementation dates um, could be subject to change. The proposed dates um, push the effective date back um, and even the, the compliance date uh, is proposed to be pushed back to September 16th of 2024, um, pending you know, the additional input. So, um, there's lots of information out there. I would highly recommend, um, you know, checking out some of uh, the virtual engagements that the EPA is hosting um, in order to gain more information. Um, but uh, until that time, we're we're kind of waiting to see what uh, what the reviews hold. Um, and then, lastly, I'll just add that if you uh, need to contact us, I think the the best way to do so, at least for the lead and copper uh, rule program, is to email the PWS LCR um, at tcq.texas.gov uh, inbox. And if Vera had some uh, additional information that she would like to add, um, please feel free to chime in um, right now, anytime. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen. OK, can you all see that? I can see it. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you. All right, so um, we wanted to have a little bit extra on the lead service line inventory portion of the proposed regulation. Um, I think everyone's probably a little concerned about the magnitude of the regulation generally, but um, particularly on this part of it, because it's going to be a lot of work um, for the large systems. Also, um, you know, problematic for smaller systems too, just to have the manpower to do the work. Um, and so we are really encouraging y'all to get started on this early um, and start, you know, if nothing else right now start because it, it's coming even even with the delay of the regulation, you know, this this regulation is coming, uh, you know, the deadlines will be here before we know it. Um, and um, even if it's just, you know, paying attention to what the service lines are when you're doing maintenance work or reading meters or whatnot in regular operations you know we really think it needs to start now um, this this portion of the regulation um, focuses on basically three different areas um, what you know where to look for information uh, the material definitions um, and also updating uh, the inventory and being transparent about the inventory now the regulation actually is very specific about where to look for the inventory information uh, it says plumbing codes permits existing records or other documentation engineering plans maps historical service records sops inspections records indicating material composition or other resources so you're not limited to looking at these um, areas specifically but you are required to look into these areas if you have them um, of course, if you're not a municipality, you're not going to have a plumbing code to look at. You're going to have to look at, you know, service connection information, work orders, um, things such as that. Um, also, if all else fails, and, and that's why time really is of the essence here because it can be very time consuming. You know, some of you, if you've taken over a system, um, you know, and the existing and original information for the original connections doesn't exist, um, you may have to look at tax records. Um, you know, tax records can reveal when a building was constructed to give you an idea of what the material is, uh, whether lead might be an issue or might not be an issue. OK, um, and the inventory, the regulation requires that it include all service lines connected to the public water system. This means that it includes uh, the customer side of it uh, if they are lead or one of the other material designations. Um, and so uh, that's something that's new to everyone. Um, probably not something anybody enjoys, but it it, it is what it is, and it, it and it's necessary in order to protect public health to ensure that we're you know uh, tracking where all the lead lines are uh, and working on a plan to replace them. Um, as I already said, you know, we really st recommend that you start looking at this now, you know, when you're doing inspections of uh, customer service inspections, when you're doing repairs, uh, responding to customer complaints, um, any, any time possible. Um, the regulation, uh, you know, defines lead as where the service line is made of lead. Um, there's also a designation for lead status unknown, where the service line material is not known to be lead. Uh, or galvanized requiring replacement or non-lead service lines, such as where there's no documented evidence supporting the material classification. The regulation also defines galvanized lines as iron steel pipes dipped in zinc to prevent corrosion. Um, galva and this is kind of a different part of the regulation. It says galvanized service lines that are downstream of a lead service line must also be replaced. They're, they're actually treated as a lead service line. Um, and on the inventory, you would in indicate galvanized requiring replacement uh, where the, the where it's known that it was downstream of a lead service line or is currently downstream of a lead status unknown service line. Um, and then, of course, the thing that, you know, most of us would want to see is that it's a non said lead service line. 
Um, and as I stated uh, earlier, when, you know, the regulation goes into three major areas and it goes quite a bit into uh, updating the inventory um, and tracking it. Um, the regulation actually says that um, you're supposed to do this, you know, even though I said start doing it now, that once the regulation goes into an effect, you are to do this in the normal course of operations. Uh, as I said, when you're reading meters or performing maintenance, it, it's it's time to start paying attention to service lines. Um, as uh, Laura said, you're uh, going to be required to update it either annually or triennial triennially. Um, if you're replacing lead service lines, you're to update it when the replacements happen. Um, and then the updated inventories need to be submitted to the state. Um, and then the regulation, the proposed regulation also requires that the inventory be publicly accessible um, and that this inventory, you have to include a location ed identifier such as uh, the address um, or another, you know, locational identifier. Uh, systems that have a population of over 50,000 must have the inventory accessible online. Um, if you don't have any lead service lines, there is a provision in the regulation uh, that you can prepare a written statement uh, in lieu of the inventory, um, and then you would also there's requirements for that statement that indicate, um, you know, where you looked and certification that you don't have any lead service lines um, in your system. OK, um, my email address is on this slide if you have additional questions on this or uh, anything else. Um, and I'm not sure. Uh, Michelle, did you want to take questions on the presentation now or are we going to uh, do that after the fact? Yeah, we'll go ahead and, and, and do that. Um, Vera, since you're already currently up on the screen, if anybody has uh, pre questions about the inventory portion, let's go ahead and let uh, Vera field those. And then we have quite a few questions that I uh, tried to address, but we still have even more in the chat for the lead and copper rule portion. So um, I did see in here, Caroline asked, does TCEQ plan to develop any templates for water systems to use for LSL inventory submittal? Great question, uh, Caroline. I, I, I don't know that we've uh, really uh, decided yet where we're going to do that. I, I We do have a unofficial template. Um, the Drinking Water Infrastructure Needs Survey required the lead service line inventory. Um, and so we do have something. If it's desired, you can email me and I can send that to you. Um, but w whether we've uh, decided to do an official template or not, that hasn't been decided yet. And just as uh, Laura kind of reiterated from the beginning, all of this rule is final. It's still under review and may not be the absolute final. Uh, so any forms we make will be based on the actual promulgated final. Um, so that way we don't uh, give you more than one option and cause any confusion by later revision. So the chances are we'll try to develop a template moving forward based on what is required and how we're going to obtain that data. Um, but for now, get your information, save it however you can, um, and uh, if possible, use uh, whatever tools such as the one Vera is uh, indicating they have um, to, to just track that information while you have it. Um, Sarah, you asked for a, a link to the inventory presentation. Yes, we'll go ahead and get that added up to the DWOG along with uh, the rest of the presentations that are available today. Vera, did you see any more questions? Ah, there we go. Uh, Kobe Bowman, does downstream of an LSL mean the subsequent service line connections downstream on the main, or is it referring to a single service line with mixed lead galvanized materials? Uh, another good question. Um, I, I think it's uh, downstream of the mixed service line galvanized materials is, is my interpretation. Okay. OK, folks, if you have any more additional inf information or questions regarding the inventory, please feel free to continue to add those. For now, we'll try and go back and hit some of the questions you had for Laura based on the LCRR overview presentation. Um, I did try to hit quite a few of those in the chat. 
Um, I did want to talk about the uh, child care facilities because there were quite a few questions. So, Laura, have you had a chance to look at those questions related to the child care facilities? I have not. Um, OK, I'll go back and okay. um, and scroll for them. Uh, they seem to kind of feature on um, who it applies to and um, what that means as far as licensed child care facilities. So um, let me go back and find the first one I don't think I've addressed. Sharon Salinas asked, we have licensed daycares in Texas. Will we be required to obtain these residence locations and test these homes as well as facilities? And I think she later went on to indicate that she meant in-home daycares. And uh, Laura, I believe from our discussions, we would consider these to be defined by the state as licensed daycare and therefore would be applicable to the rule. Is that correct, yes. Laura? Yeah, an in-home daycare, yes. So if it meets that that uh, you know barrier of being licensed at the state level, then this rule would apply. Yeah. Okay. So there is also a concern about if that applies to is the sampling requirement uh, only at licensed child care facilities or will it include other types, registered child care facilities, small employer based child care, and also would they also be required to sample? So if they meet the definition within the rule, uh, Laura, do you want to kind of line out what that would mean? Yeah, so if they meet the definition as as required by the rule of what a child care facility or um, you know, even some of these schools, if, if it meets the definition, then you're, you're on the hook for sampling, essentially. And Rick also and Rick chimed also in with, does the new child care facilities requirement only apply to community water systems? What if you have a licensed child care facility within a non-community water system? I can answer this one, Michelle. Um, so okay, yeah. in, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone again. Um, so in accordance with um, uh, 40 CFR 14192 um, is where this um, child care um, and school um, information is housed. It specifically says all community water systems um, must conduct um, this information. So, or the, the testing. So it's, um, uh, public a uh, community public water systems um, based on the information that it looks like you have provided in the chat um, you were asking about the the non-transient non-communities those would be subject to the regular lead and copper rule so they would be sampling throughout um, that public water system itself um, as um, required by the lead and copper rule thank you janelle um, let's see. I think this might be most of the questions. I do did want to reiterate that uh, uh, Alfonso Mora with uh, Dallas in asked about the um, new requirements for the CCR and uh, whether those have gone into effect. So there's two separate CCR requirements. There's the uh, America Water Infrastructure Improvement Act, the OWEA ones that are still forthcoming. Those did, they did not make the deadline that uh, they were supposed to propose CCR changes related to that. That's going to be the issuing twice per year, improved readability, et cetera. The only ones that are currently promulgated are the ones related to the LCRR, things like indicating um, education and your, your sampling. Um, and those kind of things are part of the LCRR, and they would go into effect based on the timeline set by the LCRR. So there would be additional CCR changes forthcoming, but they are not currently included in anything that is promulgated and put forth. There was also, there was also a question, question as to whether the um, schedules for copper and lead can diverge, and the answer to that is yes. Under the current rule, or under the proposed, uh, the future rule, as currently proposed, um, there is the opportunity for someone who is performing well for copper to have a reduced monitoring uh, schedule for copper and a routine monitoring schedule for lead. Um, Janelle, could you repeat the 40 CFR reference? Uh, Larry Bell has asked for that. Yeah, it's 40 CFR 
Yes. To the chat for posterity. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Or you did. I will. Yeah. Whatever. Um, there was another Nadia. question I saw from Sharon Salinas. I didn't know if we adjusted the, or addressed that one at 1045. Let me scroll back and see. 1045. Ah, good question. So service lines in Texas are private according to the PUC rules. How will MUDs have the ability to make people replace galvanized lines? Will MUDs have to incur the cost? Um, so the rule, um, and Laura, if you'd prefer to answer this, feel free to let me know. Um, but as far as make people replace lines, um, you as a water system will have the requirement of a certain percentage of replacement. There are caveats. Um, you would need to only count a full line replacement if the homeowner or private person replaces their portion of the line as well. Um, and there are actions required on your part to have the um, have them basically testify or certify that they are unwilling to meet their requirements. If they're unwilling to meet those requirements and you fail to meet your goals, then you also have to take additional public education and outreach. Um, so there, there are requirements basically on you to educate, 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 remind them regularly. Um, you can't necessarily force them to, but also develop financing, um, try to give you as many tools as possible to get cooperation. Uh, if by any chance um, that continues to fail, um, then, you know, you're really not able to make them do it. You'd have to uh, get the documentation to indicate they are unable or unwilling to do that. Um, so that's basically kind of how the rule is written out right now is almost, it almost includes so many contact points and outreach uh, almost nagging to get them to do the private side of the fill, of the line. Um, let's see. Uh, can you explain, Michelle, just when they would be required to do lead service line replacement? Uh, Laura, do you have a slide for that? I think you went over it. Uh, yeah, let me see. Um, so while, La while Laura looks for it, there's two types of lead service line replacement. Basically, um, the lesser would be what's called goal-based. Um, and that I think, and uh, Laura will double check here, but uh, that's based on, on hitting the trigger level. Whereas after the action level, then it becomes a mandatory percentage. Um, and at that point in time, you'd end up in the lead service line replacement. So, um, so um, there's, there's kind of two ways of getting there. And then if there's small systems, they have the flexibility option of choosing one of the few options. Correct, the small system gives you uh, a lot of different choices and lead service line replacement is one of those options. So if your MUD meets that requirement as a small system um, and you believe that the, the private uh, nature of the lines is going to be an issue for you, uh, I encourage you to look at those small system flexibility options and see if one of those might work better for you. Okay, Laura's got it pulled up now. Was this a slide to create a program by January 16th, 16th of 2024? Right, so no matter what kind of system you are, you'll need to have a lead service line replacement plan. And this is where you're going to think about how am I going to get this cooperation? How am I going to get these replacements done? And you can choose, you can line out how you're going to do that. There are, I think, seven or eight points you have to hit in that plan um, that help you work through your strategy. Um, and so by working through development of those plan and hitting the, hitting the minimum requirements laid out in the rule, um, you should get to uh, a strategy of how you're going to be able to move forward with those things. Elijah, I saw yours here at the end. Are you required to identify the private side of the? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, so the up to the up to the residents is where you're going to basically have to look for the line. You need to know what your side of the line is as well as what their side of the line is. Vera, do you have more information on that? No, you just beat me to the punch. But yes, that, it, the regulation is very clear that uh, you have to it, identify the lines regardless of ownership. So it's it's both private and and utility portion. Mr. Timothy Whitley, I saw that your question is why not require an RPZ installed? Um, 
what are you trying to, uh, uh, you know, avoid backflow related to? Uh, what would an RPZ, I I'm trying to get context for that question. Um, I may be able I may be able to provide some clarification while he may be typing in. Um, we've had the question numerous times in the past, and I'll let you guys answer it. But the question is, if they have a lead service line um, uh, on the private side that is lead, why don't we just require a um, RPZ at the meter? Okay. So uh, this is one of those situations where you want to look at the fact that the intent of the rule is to make sure that your water is not causing corrosion or breakdown of the line. It's not necessarily about making sure that that line doesn't come back out and damage your distribution system. So installing an RPZ and making sure that any lead stays on site is not the intent of this rule. The intent of this rule is to make sure that the water you provide is not causing undue breakdown of, of uh, potentially dangerous materials. I hope that addresses the concern. Uh, Janelle or, or Laura, if you have any additional um, information, feel free to chime in on that. You covered it nicely, thank you. Yeah, well said. Okay. Um, Blanca, I see here, will labs have access to approved LCR site lists for PWSs? Or are they able to request them? The answer to that is they are actually being provided in their reminder letters. Um, so they should have a letter from us with their approved sites written in that reminder letter. And of course, as always, they are able to request them. Um, so A, we're trying to proactively provide those, and B, they can always get them from us. Um, once again, email pwslcr at tceq.texas.gov, and we will be able to get that list to them. Um, so they sh should, you know, in theory, be able to walk into your laboratory with a letter from us um, or an email from us if they perchance misplaced their letter with their sites that are approved in or, or that are on file in our database. Let's see, what else might we have missed? Um, Veronica, so I might have missed the answer. What is the likely timeline for development of LCRR TCEQ primacy guidance? So at this point, we're on hold until the until the rule is not on hold. So because there's a potential for a a short delay and potentially be a longer delay, um, our timeline has has not moved forward at this point, and I can't give you um, solid numbers or dates. Um, however, the way that it would work is we we would need to a have their final rule 100% set in stone. Then we would be developing our rule, and that rule would then be promulgated. And only after it's been promulgated and goes through all the public notice and stakeholder input portions of our rulemaking would it become something that you all would have to comply with. So you do have significant time, but what that significant time is, I can't give you dates at this point. Uh, uh, DT Hinsel, the so labs have access to the LCR lists or only the PWSs? Only the PWSs because this is their data. Um, we do not send it to the laboratories. Um, uh, if you are working on behalf of the lab, pre please have, or if you're working on behalf of a public water system, please have the public water system reach out. A, it should be in their monitoring plan. Uh, B, uh, it's their data, which is why we provide it to them. Um, You'll see on our website that we do include lists of who's scheduled to sample when, um, but the lists themselves are not made public um, because they do contain residential addresses. Mr. Phelan went on to ask, one of the comments mentioned in the presentation, and I may have missed the intent, indicates that there will no longer be a requirement to remove aerators. Will there be any updates addressing a requirement to remove filtration devices before sampling. Example, what a filtration device at a drinking water fountain. So the the rule in general is going to have basically completely updated uh, sampling protocol. We'll have to go through and make sure that it meets all of the new requirements. Um, specifically, the new requirements are telling you not to do things that 
were not specifically precluded before and people may have been doing that could have led to inaccurate or non-representative sampling, such as removing the aerator or uh, bypassing treatment, et cetera. So really the, the new, um, the whole sampling process will be updated and you'll get new homeowner sampling instructions to make sure that A, you know how to do, and then B, you know what not to do. A lot, as I indicated, is about precluding bad practices in addition to um, encouraging good practices. And Mary asked, Mary, how are the consecutive systems going to be handled as far as corrosion control? Will TCEQ be holding stakeholder meetings as it develops its rule? Um, as always, we will be holding um, uh, public meetings as required under the rulemaking um, process. Um, as far as how consecutive systems are going to be handled related to corrosion control, uh, it does indicate there's there's quite a bit of talk about it in the rule and how that works related to water quality parameter testing and the find and fix approach. So there is quite a bit already addressed in the rule. Obviously, we'd have to be equally stringent, um, if not more stringent, than what is put forth in the federal rule. So that kind of gives you a basis of how we would treat it because that's what the rule says. We'd have to start there. Um, but if there are, you know, state-specific um, you know, opinions on that. Um, that's what the stakeholder meetings would help us develop. Janelle, Laura, do you have anything Laura, to add on that? Add on that? Um, that is exactly it. Yeah. Um, there is an additional question from uh, Nadia at uh, ten fifty three about polyorthophosphate. Will polyorthophosphate be regulated under the LCRR? So I guess it depends on what you consider regulated. Under the lead and copper rule revisions, the regulation is treatment technique based. The only regulations that cause you to have, uh, you know, downstream requirements are going to be your performance related to copper and to lead. However, if that means that you are doing corrosion control treatment, then yes, you would need to make sure that you are measuring anything you are added as part of your water quality parameters, which would include um, ortho. Uh, Vera, Vera, I know that it very specifically doles out what types of treatment are available. Do you feel comfortable kind of addressing that concern there? Yeah, the, uh, actually for the corrosion controls uh, study part of the uh, regulation, it's real specific on what you have to look at. Once, once you hit, you know, a trigger level or have an action level exceedance, um, and it does not include uh, blended phosphate, which is, I think, what we're talking about here. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, you would not be able to use a blended phosphate to address the issue um, if you have um, hit the trigger level or have an action level exceedance. Um, but it, as far as uh, regulation, I think that it, it's already regulated, is, is if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, Vera, can you also explain that if they make any changes to their chemicals or sure, uh, sure. yeah, sure, and that and that's what I meant. Thanks, Janelle. That's what I meant by regulated. If you if you make any changes to uh, your chemicals that you're adding or even uh, decide not to add, that requires a submittal to the plan review team. Um, and if you have additional questions on that, you can uh, send me an email, or you can also email our section email box, which is ptrs at tceq.texas.gov. Awesome. Uh, Janelle, did you see any more that we have failed to answer? I was just going through. Um, I don't see any as of right now. OK, well then, um, if you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and move forward into our next presentation related to Winter Storm Uri. And uh, obviously, if anything else additionally comes up, we can come back around. So um, go ahead and share that to y'all. Hopefully you can see that. Um, let's see. So for those of you who uh, who live in Texas, everybody, uh, winter storm Uri impacted pretty much everyone. So we wanted to kind of do a little bit of lessons learned and, and items of uh, thought and concern to move forward. 
as uh, we work towards, uh, for instance, the, the stakeholder groups that uh, Brittany is working on in the survey and any information we might get back from you guys. But this is sort of the low, low hanging fruit we wanted to put out there for you guys. So, um, I wanted to first put out their communication. Um, we as the Water Supply Division worked closely with the Small Business and Local Government Assistance Group to send an email about the weather preparedness, provide boil water notice templates, et cetera, uh, when it looked like that cold weather event was going to be a, a serious occurrence a um, couple of days before um, Valentine's Day. Um, the agency as a whole created a severe cold weather event webpage um, where they posted resources, forms, et cetera. That page is still up. Um, so if you'd like to go back and take a look at um, resources, uh, the rule suspensions that happened, um, uh, general uh, situational updates, that kind of thing, um, you can pull some uh, historical information from there. Um, that might be good if you're doing an actor, actor, after action report or something else like that. Um, and just so you know, this creating a specific web page is pretty common for us as an agency. We try to do that. So if you're, you know, struggling and, and uh, you, can, you don't know what number to call or, or you don't know where to search on our web page to find something that is probably, you know, really prevalent and needed because of the storm, I would encourage you to look for a specific, like when you land on our web page, there's going to be a box that pops up that says hot topics or current or, or new. Um, and we try to make those as easy to find as possible so that you guys can communicate well with us and we can communicate well with you. And then um, just like a lot of you were without uh, heat and water, we were also without heat and water, but worked through the storm and tried to coordinate, communicate and mitigate as much as possible um, from, uh, from our homes uh, or out in the field. I wanted to point out uh, the third party sampling. So just so y'all know, um, we uh, work very closely. Uh, it's not the best of times because it's the end of the end of the quarter when this store came through. So some samples were unable to be shipped because FedEx, UPS, et cetera, weren't running. Um, and then some of those ones that were shipped uh, exceeded hold times by the time they were received or because the laboratories were inaccessible or their instruments were down because they were lacking power, um, water, et cetera. Some of those exceeded hold time. Um, we were able to coordinate sampling delays uh, through the contractor to make sure that we would have less issues. We weren't collecting samples that would never make it to the lab and would never get processed. And then we were able to prioritize rec recollection after the fact to get those taken care of. So thank you to everyone who potentially had to have two sampling events because something was rejected. And then thank you to everyone who was really flexible right there at the end of the quarter to get all of your quarterly samples uh, scheduled and taken care of. At this point, we don't feel, um, based on our records of what was collected, that there will be any monitoring reporting violations for inability to sample or for any rejection. So um, thank you to all of you. Uh, you know, uh, teamwork makes the dream work. So thank you for working with our third party sampler and then also for working with our laboratories. We had to stay within their capacity. Um, so we had to pace ourselves and get those taken care of. Um, as part of that, uh, not only is there the chem program, but the lab outreach related to bacteriological samples, because if a thousand water systems go on boil water notice, a thousand systems need to take samples to get off of boil water notice. So um, we were actively working with the laboratories and we want to give a shout out to the labs. Thank you so much for, for stepping up when people needed you. Um, we had 57 labs that were able to accept, accept samples over the weekend. Um, and we had two, 22 labs that are typically internal labs um, that were gracious enough to offer their services to external customers to help, to help people get up and running. Um, specifically, Corpus uh, offered free testing to the folks in their area to help them get up and running. And uh, LCRA was able to waive, waive weekend fees. Uh, and in addition to our existing capacity in the state, EPA was able to bring down some mobile labs to some of the hardest hit areas and offer a little extra capacity there. So thank you guys very much um, for uh, stepping up laboratories. And then this is just a shameless plug to every water system to make sure that, um, yes, I'm glad that you have a good primary laboratory, that you have a relationship built with your primary laboratory, but please take the, the time and energy to develop a relationship with a backup or secondary laboratory. Um, you never know when somebody will be without power or be without water 
or be inaccessible and you'll need that backup um, laboratory for for your samples and your sample needs. So um, please, you know, in this time of not emergency, uh, work on those small preparedness steps. Some RTCR takeaways, like I mentioned earlier, sample early and often. Um, the earlier you can get uh, information in, the less likely you are to run out of time. Um, you can always front load the month. Not only does that help you um, because your samples are done, but that also helps the laboratory because then they can concentrate on getting the, the results of the analysis in and reported to us um, in the future um, and meet those timelines of the 10th. Uh, for them, if, if people come in that last week, they're trying to both do analysis and reporting and it's, it's a lot of work on their side. Um, like I said, plan ahead when bad weather is forecasted. Um, some people, you know, maybe never checked the weather and didn't realize this was going to be bad, let alone nearly as bad as it was. So um, give yourself a, a sampling schedule that pads a little bit of time um, so that if you lose a day or two or a week, um, you can still meet your minimum deadlines. We did want to reiterate, and this is a question that came up very, very regularly, is if special samples could be used for routine monitoring, and they, they can't. Um, they are not something that's acceptable under, under our quality assurance project plan, our QAPP. So, um, you know, if you did specials to, to lift your boil water notice as required by rule, that's fantastic. Um, however, uh, we cannot use those to meet your minimum RTCR requirements. The idea behind RTCR is to take samples that are representative of your system, and uh, boil water notice should not typically be your regular operations. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Patrick now, um, and he'll give you some information about the boil water notices. All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so just to kind of give a little overview of the scale of the boil water notices uh, and the number of them, uh, the peak day that the most systems were on boil water notice was February 19th. And at that time, uh, there were almost 2,000 systems on boil water notice, uh, 1,985. And that was affecting about 16.5 million customers. Um, and that represents about 40% uh, of the uh, community water systems in Texas. So, uh, uh, you know, a large uh, percentage of the systems were under boil water notice. Um, 26 of these systems served more than 100,000 customers, uh, but uh, 1,545 served less than 33 hundred customers each. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these uh, systems were smaller systems, but um, with so, uh, you know those 26 large systems, that uh, accounts for a lot of people served. Um, and generally the, you know, the number of OR notices that were issued in that couple week span uh, surpassed the number of full water notices that are typically issued in a uh, quote unquote normal year for the entire year. Uh, so this was a, a, a huge event. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so as you know, has been uh, talked about already, um, you know, the the common reasons for the boil water notices uh, were, you know, power outages to the plants, which caused low pressure or lack of treatment, uh, water line breaks within the system uh, caused by freezing, which also, you know, led to loss of pressure. Uh, there were also equipment uh, malfunctions or damage um, because of the freezing temperatures, again, leading to loss of pressure or lack of treatment. Then you had the uh, limited or no access to water systems uh, due to the hazardous road conditions. Um, and then finally, uh, a lot of consecutive systems that got water from another system that issued a boil water notice um, had to issue the boil water notice as well. So um, in the end, it was really about freezing, causing issues to infrastructure, and then the power outages that um, led to 
loss of uh, pressure and loss of treatment. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there were some kind of common questions and um, I guess issues that came up. Um, let's see here, sorry. Um, and the uh, one of the the big ones is we got quite a few questions from customers uh, that were confused about really which water system they get water from. Uh, one of the examples is uh, when you have a, a larger city that has multiple water systems serving uh, customers in that city, um, for example, uh, districts within city boundaries, um, and the, the district issued a boil water notice, but the city did not, um, there were uh, some there was some confusion about whether the rest of the city was on boil water notice or not. Um, so one thing to take away from that is uh, the need to be very clear of what area is affected and under boil water notice. Um, and you know I would also suggest you know kind of regularly communicating with your customers so that they do know um, you know where they're getting their water from. I know uh, for for people in the water industry, that seems like kind of crazy that somebody wouldn't know where their water is coming from. But uh, with a lot of apartments and and uh, places where the customers are not being billed directly by the water system, uh, there can be that confusion. Uh, another question that came up was uh, regarding consecutive systems and when. Um, when they should be taking their samples and resending the notices. Um, and the big thing with that is it's important to communicate and coordinate with the system that you're getting the water from. Um, you know, you don't want to resend your notice before your provider resends theirs, because um, again, that will lead to a lot of confusion. And um, if your provider is still on boil water notice, you know, that means that uh, they have they have not uh, you know taken the the samples yet and gotten that the samples back to resend yet so um, again it's it's important to communicate and coordinate with the system that you get your water from so you can get that timing straight so that you're not um, you're not resending before they do but then you're also not having to wait you know, longer extended periods of time to rescind your notice. All right, next slide. OK, and then um, we also had questions about, you know, we issued a boil water notice as a precaution, but we never lost pressure. Do we have to still take the bacteriological samples to rescind the boil water notice? Um, and the answer is whenever a boil water notice is issued, um, you know, regardless of if the the situation uh, that normally requires a boil water notice uh, happened, um, for example, loss of pressure, whenever a boil water notice is issued, samples must be taken. Those samples must come back negative uh, before resending the boil water notice. Uh, and then the kind of the overarching kind of last thing is, you know, this um, this winter storm event affected a lot of systems that do not typically issue boil water notices on a regular basis. And so there were a lot of questions from systems about just the overall process of issuing a boil water notice and rescinding the notice. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to take this opportunity to say that really um, you need to be prepared at any time to issue a boil water notice. Uh, having the templates for the notice ready um, to just plug in the, the specific information about this event uh, so that you can get it out to your customers quickly um, is, is a great way to be prepared. Uh, also identifying the personnel that are going to be responsible for the different tasks. So, you know, obviously you're going to have folks that are, um, you know, working to resolve the, the issues that caused the blow water notice. But then you also need uh, folks that are working on getting the boil water notice out to customers. 
Um, and then also part of that is building those communication channels with your customers and then also your local media so that you know um, you know you know how to get a hold of your local media quickly to get the notice um, out to the the masses um, knowing you know what they require for that what kind of time frame they need um, and just in general knowing who you need to notify to get that to the media uh, also with that building communication channels just regularly communicating with your customers so that you can uh, reach them in a timely manner uh, and then just generally knowing knowing the boiler notice requirements and resend requirements and uh, knowing your lab uh, and the hours of operation but also having some backup labs in case your lab is not able to take your samples uh, so the, the big thing there is kind of being being prepared for an event that might not happen regularly but but can happen um, and you know the the end goal is to notify your customers as promptly as possible um, and so taking these um, steps to prepare will will help in that uh, help for that goal so i believe that's all i have michelle oh sorry um also the website on this uh on this slide is where you can find the templates for the boil water notices. So again, I encourage you to take a look at that site, have it bookmarked, um, but also just download those those templates in advance. Again, so you can just fill in the information and, and get them out to, to your customers as quickly as possible. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we also have um, some information about emergency authorizations from the plan and technical review team. Hello everyone again. Um, yeah, I was asked to talk for a few minutes about uh, emergency authorizations with respect to winter storm URI. Um, and when I started thinking about it, I started thinking, oh, well, there's a lot of people who don't know about emergency author authorizations generally. And so uh, that's why I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, the rules do require that for most facility improvements that you get approval prior to construction. Um, the regulations really don't have any leeway on that, but we do have a process uh, that we've come up with to deal with that because, you know, we have a lot of small systems. We have a lot of situations where you have a major line break um, and, and you need to do an interconnection or uh, you have a well go down um, and you need to, you know, get approval uh, really quick. And so we actually have a process to deal with the routine normal emergencies that water systems experience besides the natural disaster type ones that we just experienced um, and that we've experienced in the past during hurricanes and whatnot. Um, and so if you find yourself in this kind of situation, um, there is a process where we actually authorize a well replacement or an emergency interconnection, or we've also done uh, chemical approvals for water quality complaints, um, things such as that. Uh, this, this, processes that I'm talking about right now is for permanent permanent facility improvements, not not temporary fixes um, that we might use during a natural disaster. Um, and so basically uh, what's required is we require a written statement which can come through email uh, to us. Um, you can send it directly to me or you can send it to the uh, section email box. Uh, which um, I think Joel posted in the chat at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, it's ptrs at tcq.texas.gov. Um, we do require that an engineer be on board since plans and specifications by an engineer are required for facility improvements. Um, uh, we ask that you explain why it's an emergency. Why do we need to construct before approval? What's going on? We ask you for information. Um, uh, usually, uh, uh, the process I think works best when you email us and then we coordinate with the regional office. Um, basically, but that doesn't prohibit you from going ahead and talking to them also. Uh, we do have some folks that contact the regional office and then contact us and that works too. Uh, it's not, as I said, this is not in the regulation. This is just sort of a process we've come up with to deal with uh, emergencies with water systems. Um, 
at times it seems like we do a lot of these, but it's really not that many in the whole scheme of things because we do about a review of over 2,000 plans a year. We did 20 in uh, FY20 of uh, these emergency authorizations where we send a letter saying, go ahead and drill your well, go ahead and do your interconnection, go ahead and do uh, this water line replacement, uh, whatever the case may, do, may be, and then there's a timeline for submitting uh, engineering documents on that improvement. Um, next slide, please. OK, now uh, during a natural disaster like URI, um, the new normal has become temporary fixes. Um, and, and it's not limited to URI at all. It actually started in recent hurricanes and tropical storms that we've had with water hauler requests, uh, requests for emergency approval to haul water to particular systems. Um, these are a little bit, we're a little bit less stringent on the engineer involvement. That doesn't mean that it can't come from an engineer. Um, it's for a temporary fix, as I said, and basically uh, we require that you submit an email explaining what you want to do, some information on the improvements uh, uh, that you're planning on doing. If it's a temporary tank, we're going to, you know, if it's a if it's a poly tank, um, we're going to want to know, you know, is it NSF? Um, you know, any basic information that you can give us about the uh, improvement. Um, and it, it can come from the public water system responsible official. Um, and then uh, during uh, tropical storm or tropical storm, excuse me, winter storm URI, I, I'm getting ready for the next season, y'all. Um, for winter storm URI, uh, we did uh, temporary authorizations for water haulers, temporary interconnections, uh, batch chlorination was a was a, a a big thing that we haven't done before. Um, we also uh, did an emergency authorization to construct a water well. We had a system, a one system. Uh, water uh, a system with one water well go down and uh, request an emergency authorization to drill a water well. We also had some reviews pending uh, that we expedited uh, to help the systems get off their boil water notices. Um, these authorizations are done for a, a, a limited uh, time period generally, even though I speak of the emergency authorization. Um, they're usually done for a 90 day period for things like we're going to OK, we're going to bypass the tank so we can uh, dire uh, directly connect to our uh, wholesaler uh, until we get power back. Or uh, there was a situation that we approved where we uh, approved bypassing a um, granular activated carbon treatment uh, that was um, in addition to you know the two, three, four log treatment that's required for surface water, uh, the thought was that if they bypass this treatment, they might be able to get more water to one of their customers that was struggling. Um, but we're pretty much open to, I mean, uh, a gamut of possibilities when when we're in this kind of situation. Um, and as Michelle stated, you know, we even though a lot of us didn't have power or water, um, you know, we were still there was a lot of people who could work who did work. Um, and we were working uh, during this time period um, and doing these emergency authorizations. OK, um, I think that's all I have on that topic. Michelle. Thank you, Vera. I appreciate it. And thank you, Patrick, as well. Um, I wanted to point out that Joel did confirm that the uh, next cross connection sub, con sub con cross connection control subcommittee is set for June the 3rd and that they'll go ahead and get that uh, web, web page updated. Um, I also did reshare the um, the link to get to all the templates. This is boil water notices, all public notices, and then also the certificates of delivery associated to those. And then, uh, let's see, there was also a concern about um, the intent of TCR monitoring to be representative of the entire month. Yes, that is correct. And the idea behind early and often is more about the often. Um, if you're intending to do the first week and you get delayed to the second, third or fourth week, that's OK. You still have time, but we don't want to always aim for the fourth week and consistently miss. Um, so that's why we encourage people to do often as well. Uh, we unfortunately heard quite a few stories about people who are needing to do 40 samples a month. And by the time the freeze happened on the 14th, they had taken no samples for the month. Um, that's obviously not representative of the month either. They hadn't taken anything for the first two weeks. So really, it's about moderation. It's being in there and being building yourself safety. Um, and also, the intent is 
to meet the minimum requirements, um, but also to protect public health. Um, if you're never checking except for that first week or that fourth week or that third week, um, it's about doing it often enough that you're getting representative of the performance for your system in general and in whole. Um, this is also, you know, um, uh, you guys are probably all aware by now because we, we had this conversation um, or touch on it pretty regularly, but uh, the TCEQ is a primacy state, so we have to maintain at least the federal minimums. Um, so that minimum sample taken each month is set by the federal government and it's not you know, really accounting for natural disasters, um, which is why, uh, you know, it's about being prepared and knowing that those can happen. Um, even if it's bad weather from a perspective that there's a windstorm in West Texas and you know you shouldn't take samples when there's sand in the air, um, it's about knowing your system and knowing what you're regularly impacted by. I understand that this was outside of what most systems are regularly impacted by. We don't have a severe cold weather event that causes a virtual blackout for the for the uh, the, t the state that is very irregular and doesn't happen on, on a normal basis. But the good news is um, we didn't have a significant number of monitoring reporting violations beyond what we would typically have in a month um, based on our preliminary review of the data that came in. So um, although people expressed concerns, um, many people were able to get those samples they needed to. I don't know if that meant because they were able to uh, lift their boil water notice faster than they had intended or uh, whether they were just able to really uh, take advantage of that last week of the month. Um, but uh, we, we didn't see an exorbitant number of violations. Um, so yes, we, we do try to be conscious, but we also know that we have a stringent minimum that we have to meet. Um, one of the other questions that we just received is, um, Region 12 has tested a manganese correction factor on free groundwater systems for the last several CCIs for informational purposes. Can you clarify how TCEQ intends to use this information and what, if any, changes to rules or interpretations could be forthcoming? Um, Al, are you still on the line? Would you be able to, do you have any information about what the uh, region might be doing in that case? Hi, Michelle, I'm still here. Um, let me turn on my camera. I don't uh, don't have any information. I hadn't heard of this. I, I apologize for that. Uh, but if I need to do some follow up work to get you some information, I can. You can just email me uh, and I'll do my best to get the, the best information for you. Thanks, Al. Um, just as a general note to to um, everyone who is doing their chlorine or disinfectant um, residual testing, Bear in mind that uh, there are sometimes interferences and corrections that are required, and please read through your owner's manual. It could be, um, for instance, if they're using the Hawk meter, there is already a predetermined interference re related to manganese and a recommended uh, a change to the analysis um, or use of a separate analysis to address that interference. So um, please make sure that as you're doing your disinfectant monitoring, you're doing so appropriately and making any um, accountings for or updates and revisions to your procedure, procedures and processes based on knowing that uh, your water has that in it. Um, So uh, I do know that you're correct. The Hawk manual doesn't necessarily state it unless you have a significant um, interference, which is why there are opportunities to also choose uh, FACTS testing or potentially the, the iodide version of the test um, if you know you have naturally occurring manganese. Um, but like I said, I'll go uh, get in contact with Al and we'll try to find out what's going on in the region related to that. Um, that's an initiative outside of um, what we're aware of here. If there are no other questions at this time, um, I'd like to go ahead and move forward to our last presentation of the day with Aaron Kent Poole related to the Consumer Confidence Report. Um, while Aaron's getting set up, um, Sarah, um, um, let's see, Carlock, if you could let us know your contact information, um, you can email it to me. I'll put my email address in the chat, um, then we can um, address your corrections back with you.
Aaron, we can now see your presentation, um, but you are on mute if you're trying to present. All right, jump the gun on the presentation <laughs> before unmuting. Get this up in just one moment. All right, so hopefully you're able to see the slides and both hear me. <laughs> yes, I can see both your slides and hear your audio. Thank you, Erin. Perfect. So my name is Erin Kentpool, and I'm Natural Resources Specialist in the Drinking Water Technical Review Team of the Water Supply Division. And today I'll be going over how to fill out and submit a consumer confidence report. So some important information, the Consumer Confidence Report, or CCR, is an annual water quality report that summarizes the previous year's data. You can find the requirements in the 290 rules, subchapter H. The TCEQ has created a CCR generator tool to assist systems. However, additional information must be added to the template to have a compliant report. The CCR is due to customers on or before July 1st, and the CCR, along with the Certificate of Delivery, is also due to TCEQ by July 1st. We will go over the steps to generate, edit, and distribute your, report, your CCR, as well as how to complete the Certificate of Delivery and submit the documents to TCEQ. So step one, using the generator tool to create your report. To start, visit the Texas Drinking Water Watch website. Then click on the button that says Generate CCR Report on the left side of the screen. This will open a new tab. The CCR generation site should now be open and look like this. Search for your water system using your seven digit public water system identification number in the box next to Enter or Select Water System on the top left side. Next, select the CCR year that you would like to generate using the Select CCR Year drop down menu. For example, if you are preparing the report due by July 1st, 2021, select 2020 for the CCR year. Last, click the Generate Report button at the bottom of the screen. When the pop-up menu at the bottom of the screen is displayed, choose Open, which will then open your generated CCR document in a new window. If you do not see this pop-up menu, you may have a pop-up blocker enabled, um, so try again after you disable your pop-up blocker, and if you still have issues, call the Water Supply Division at 512-239-4691. Once the document opens in a separate window, you'll be able to edit and save. To save or print, use that file option in the top left corner. Okay, step two, editing and filling out the CCR. The first page of the generated CCR template is informational. Please read over the paragraph listed on this page to familiarize yourself with the CCR background information. This page should not be included in the document sent to customers and TCEQ. Next, verify that the generated CCR is for your water system. Your water system name and ID number should appear on the top of the page. Once you confirm the template is for the correct system, there are several fields to fill out on page two. To begin, fill out the source information and county where the system is located in the top left corner. Next, fill in the section on the upper right hand side, which indicates a contact name and phone number. The contact number should be a representative for the water system, not a TCEQ contact. This information serves as a resource for any customers who may have questions about the CCR. Below the contact information, fill out the Spanish language section in case a customer needs assistance in Spanish. If you have questions about this section, feel free and reach out to us. 
Next, we see the definitions and abbreviations. Be sure not to delete this section as they are required by the 290 rules, subchapter H. The next page will include required health information. And if your system exceeded the secondary maximum contaminant level for fluoride, there will be an extra section to fill out indicating the level present and who to contact for information. You must fill out this information as it is also part of the required language for the CCR. Remember the public water system contact should be a representative of the system and not a TCEQ contact. To find the value for the fluoride concentration, use the table found in the body of the CCR and use the highest level detected to fill in the blank indicated by that blue arrow. The fluoride results can be found in the inorganics contaminant table in the row for fluoride and column labeled highest level detected. Moving on from fluoride, if your system purchases water, you will also need to include a table containing any contaminant that was detected from the provider's water system, unless that contaminant was monitored separately in your system. For example, if you monitor TTHM in your system, you do not have to include the TTHM levels in your from your provider. Your provider should give you the necessary information to complete the section by April 1st of each year. Contact your provider with any questions about the data you may have or if the data was not submitted to you. You may also generate your providing system CCR, then cut and paste their regulated contaminant tables into this section. If you generated your provider's CCR, copy and paste the tables from your provider that your system is not monitoring into your report. You should only copy and paste entry point samples from your provider's CCR to yours. The copied provider table should be posted in the place indicated by the red arrow onto your original generated CCR document. The next section is information about source water. If your water system has a source water assessment completed, it will only have one area to fill out with your water system contact and phone number. Again, the contact information should be a representative for your system. If your system has not had a source water assessment done yet, then there will be a statement included as indicated by the red arrow, and there is no further action needed for this paragraph. All systems will need to fill out the disinfectant residual table in the CCR. The values that need to be added can be found in your disinfectant level quarterly operating report if you have a groundwater system, or your surface water monthly operating report if you have a surface water system. Be sure to fill out the type of disinfectant residual used by your system, the yearly average level, the range of levels detected, the unit of measure, and whether there was an MCL violation. All the required fields indicated by the red arrows. Finally, be sure that any violations incurred throughout the year are listed under the violation section of the report. Do not remove any violations from this table without the written consent of the Water Supply Division. If you have a question on the status of a violation, reach out to a compliance officer. Additionally, if you are using the CCR to post public notices, please contact the Water Supply Division at 512-239-4691 and ask for a public notice compliance officer. The information included in this table is not sufficient to fulfill public notice requirements. Be sure to save your documents once you have made all your edits. Step three, distributing your CCR. The options for distributing your CCR are based on your system's population. To verify your population, visit the Texas Drinking Water Watch and use your seven digit public water system ID to search for your system. If you have a system that serves a population of 500 or less, you must make a good faith effort to notify customers that the CCR is available.
If you are a community public water system that serves over 500 people, you are required to directly deliver a copy or a link to each bill paying customer, as well as make a good faith effort to notify customers that don't receive bills of its availability. Step four, completing your certificate of delivery. Systems serving 500 people or less will use a small system certificate of delivery, which can be found on the TCEQ web CCR website. A copy of the appropriate form should also be included in the annual reminder letter sent out to systems every spring. Start by filling in the year of the report, water system name, PWSID number, and date distributed to customers. Next, fill out the delivery method section. At least one method should be checked off. Include the calendar year for the CCR being distributed. Finally, fill out the bottom section indicating the name of the person certifying the document the position or title held in the organization, and a good phone number for contact, then sign and date the certificate of delivery. If your water system serves over 500, then you will use a community certificate of delivery also available on the TCEQ CCR website. Again, fill out the top portion of the document similar to the small system form. Under direct delivery method, check all that apply, but at least one of the listed options. Be sure to note that if a web link is selected, it must be a direct link that takes customers to an open CCR. If your system serves over 100,000 people or more, you are required to post the CCR to a publicly available website. Fill out the website information in the space indicated by the red arrow. Next, select at least one good faith delivery method. Again, add the CCR calendar year and contact information for the person certifying the document. Step five, submit the CCR and certificate of delivery to the TCEQ and you will find the mailing address options listed at the bottom of your certificate of delivery. I will wrap this up with some common questions we receive re regarding the CCR. Does a violation that has been returned to compliance still need to be included in the CCR? Yes, all violations incurred in the calendar year of the CCR must be included. If you have a question on the status of a violation, reach out to a compliance officer at 512-239-4691. If we provide a link to the water system homepage and there's a clear link to the CCR, does that count for the direct delivery method? No, the link provided to customers must go to an open CCR. Can we post the CCR on Facebook, Nextdoor, etc.? You can post to those popular sites, however, it will not count as a direct delivery method. If we send in the certificate of delivery with the link to the CCR, can TCEQ print it? No, per federal regulation, they must both be mailed. And finally, <laughs> when will we go to the biannual CCR delivery? Uh, the EPA, as Michelle has said, um, has not finalized the details for the upcoming changes to the CCR and applicable systems should be notified once these changes are implemented. Thank you for listening and here are some additional resources and contact information. And if you would like to see a full length instructional video, it can be found at one of the links below. Thank you, Erin. Let me go ahead and pause for a few moments. I didn't see any uh, questions in the chat thus far, but if you have any, please have take this opportunity to throw them in there and we'll get them answered for you. OK, we don't have any questions related to the CCR. There was one question related to uh, bacteriological sampling from the event. Um, I did one and what I can say is to reiterate what was already covered. Um, if a sample is taken and marked as special for the purpose of rescinding a boil water notice, it will not count towards compliance. Uh, 
So if insufficient compliance samples were taken for the month, the uh, system could earn a monitoring reporting violation. Um, sampling the next month will return that violation to compliance. The only outstanding requirement would be to do a public notice. Um, the public notice does allow you to include any corrective action, so indicate you've already taken care of it, and then also allows you to give any objective uh, information. So if you indicate that we were unable to sample because of URI, you can tell them how many of your samples you were able to take, et cetera. As long as it's objectively true, that is um, allowable. And being as that is a tier three violation, that can be included in your CCR, as Aaron was, was speaking earlier, um, to reduce any additional cost related to postage or shipping. Um, hopefully that addresses the question. I did not see any more questions. And we are coming up on the end of our allotted time, but we're very open to any questions you may have, um, especially for Aaron or anyone else who presented today uh, before our time is up. So I'll go ahead and pause here for a few moments and see if we think have anything additional. Okay, I'm still not seeing any additional questions or concerns in the chat, so um, please uh, take this opportunity. We have the uh, CCR generator up pretty early this year, so if you can take the opportunity to get that generated uh, soon and uh, get that taken care of. Uh, those are, as, as Aaron indicated, due to your customers by July the 1st. Um, and I just want to go ahead and also encourage you to participate in the survey that um, the um, that Brittany mentioned earlier related to the winter storm event, and then also to uh, let us know of any questions or concerns you have and keep tuned in related to the LCRR and what EPA is putting out there. Take advantage of any opportunities you may have to give your input at a federal level um, about the extensions or about concerns you have as those opportunities become available. Our next DWOG meeting is going to be in the fourth quarter, which will be July of 2021 with the date to be determined. It's usually a Tuesday. It'll either be the second or the third, depending on these calendar and availability. We'll post that to our DWOG website at our earliest opportunity. Once again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic day. Um, this will be, um, I will go ahead and end the recording, um, get it uh, cleaned up, and it will be going to YouTube if you choose to tune back in. And as indicated before, the PowerPoint presentations are available on our DWOG website. Um, let me go ahead and show you that real quick um, so that you can come back in the future if you need to. So as I indicated right here, in this section presentations and handouts from today so you'll have our program updates the lessons learned lead and copper rule preparing consumer confidence and then there's also some informational uh a flyer about some free cybersecurity training that is available and we will also be adding in the lead service line inventory presentation as well all right thank you folks we appreciate your time and i hope to see you again in july have a great day Thank you.